We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Mandry and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And uh, my DVR is precariously close to full because I started watching The Punisher. I, I couldn't resist. I'm enjoying it. I, I like that show so far. Three episodes in. I am also three episodes in, I believe. And yeah. uh, which was three episodes? Is it Restock? Is that the one where they um, go to go uh, to home to get the guns from Homeland Security or whatever it is? Is that the one? Uh, or is it the one where he's with, uh, what's his name? It's it's when he's Micro. with the hacker dude. Micro. Yeah. Or at least that's the last one I saw. Maybe that was only episode two. <laughs> that I might have been two. Wrong. That could have been two. Anyways, it doesn't make any difference. Um, I, I, I got to admit, I'm not following this one quite as closely. I uh, watched it and... Uh, I was sort of not. I was. I had my phone in the room. I wasn't paying total attention. It, it's not quite holding me, uh, the way that the other ones have. I f don't feel like visually it has much to offer. It's it's just hmm. like shots of people saying things. There's nothing, you know. It's like, at least in the defenders, there was like everything was color coordinated, uh, you know, coordinated and stuff like that. Uh, and the first couple and the last couple of episodes of uh, what's his name. Uh, Iron Fist, you know, they yep. have the weird stuff going on. Uh, there was a lot in Daredevil. Daredevil was just really well shot. And, of course, uh, Jessica Jones was as well, I felt, uh, just visually, if we're just talking visually. Uh, so mm -hmm. far, the character, I think that they're handling him pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I feel like they're handling him pretty well. He's um, he's a tough one because especially in the in the current environment because when that comic was written it was like this was it was like this guy is is living out everybody's fantasies you know as far as you know revenge and all of that and then our current climate today where we're a little more cognizant of just actually how messed up that must be it's very hard to make him into oh, see, a seeing anti -hero. the world in purely black and white the way that he does that that is a horrible way to decide what to do so exactly uh, yeah exactly yeah, so uh, it, it they're, they're doing a fairly good job of making him of humanizing him while mm -hmm. still making him somewhat empathetic the fact that they keep bringing his wife up like don't forget his wife is dead <laughs> it's like they can't, don't forget because he's about to do something he horrible. Can't. <laughs> yeah he's gonna do something terrible oh i forgot to look up the listeners of the week uh yep yep uh, hold on did you also did you plug in hardwired because you were a robot voice on my end and probably for the live feed but so, oh is so, that true That's... so shall it be we'll, we'll have a clean feed later on so no worries hopefully uh yeah i i did i am hardwired in i don't know why okay. i would have gone off of that so no I well done maybe while you're looking it up i'll do the preamble if you want yeah go ahead and we can do out. that oh wait a second here uh who's the last one nope we got no new listeners of the week so well that we that makes it easy then all it right it does all it's right all this on is... you this is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. Go to www.avrant.com. Leave us a comment. Facebook.com slash avrant podcast. YouTube.com slash C slash AV Rant, where you can see the full behind the scenes robotic voice Tom two hour video. Me, what if all of the voice is robotic? That actually would make better continuity. <laughs> if if people if people continue to somehow watch this version more than the the proper version with clean audio and actual images and stuff when we're talking about images, that I'm very will concerned really baffle me. I mean, it, really, it, really baffle me. The waveform looks fine. The waveform looks okay. I mean, it's no, no, no. The local really recording will be fine. It's just our internet connection is a little bit shoddy tonight, so that's how I it goes. am hardwired in. You actually literally yeah, saw me do it. Might be mine. <sighs> If you want to contact us directly, it's uh, Rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at First Reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. I got a suggestion today from somebody named James who said, can uh, we have a Twitter account that is just dedicated to the podcast uh, that we can both use uh, having to follow our individual. He doesn't want to follow our individual account because of political views being shared. Dude, 
follow at avrant underscore Tom. You will get nothing but the podcast because I don't post anything to Twitter personal anymore. If wow. I do, if, if, I don't know about if, uh, if if the minimal amount of uh, of political or humor or whatever that I that I tweet out there is enough to send somebody off, then well, okay. just follow me. I mean, I, 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 I'm, <laughs> I'm right. clearly I'm I don't do anything. That's right. You are just the podcast feed. Yeah, so that is true. AV rent underscore Tom. We also have a, uh, a producer, Austin. He helps with our putting together a list together. Dude, what is going on with the review? I, I don't know. Heard from I haven't heard from Austin. I haven't talked to him. I have. I have got to. I asked. I asked him to call me a while back, and he never did. So I think he, he's like, I don't want to give him back. So I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to. Put he's probably gonna have people over for Christmas. Probably still wants to have them. <laughs> Yeah, our internet connection sucks. Yeah, I, I think, that's, yeah. I think it's my, my, I know my one of my kids is out there watching some sort of video for homework, so that's part mm. of it. So. Bandwidth limitations. Yeah. Anyways, Austin, uh, our producer helps with the, the, the question list and is also doing a video review slash tutorial for... Uh, big subs and oddly shaped rooms which will be coming out soon austin i know you listen to the podcast soon so uh <laughs> let's see what else uh yeah he has his own he has his own twitter at austin pond t-e-n austin pond uh he has also his own podcast that we watch movies podcast a podcast about how air does or does not circulate through very small rooms with bright lights on it and no ac because it's too cool outside for the ac to kick in but too hot in the room to live comfortably it's a targeted podcast it's that's why they called targeted. it we watch movies it is targeted very for specific. my specific situation at this moment mm -hmm. i am literally sweating this is going to be two hours of moist tom if you've ever wanted to see somebody slowly melt Go mm -hmm. to youtube.com slash C slash AV rant and look for podcast number 568. Well, I don't know what the name of it's going to be, but whatever the name is, it will be me melting slowly. I am extremely uncomfortable and this is, this is only going to get worse. I need a towel or a sponge. I mean, it's cold enough here. I've gone to the extreme of actually closing my window. So a rarity. I, I opened my, my window but... knowing full well that uh, there's a hole in the screen and bugs will come in and that my neighbor's AC never goes off. So that will almost certainly go on at some time. So I don't care at this point. I need some sort of circulation. It is extremely hot in this room. All right. Let's thank our listeners of the week. We want to go to patreon.com and thank our 33 patrons, including Ian. They went to Patreon, Patreon, which is a website where you can support the podcast by setting up a monthly donation of your choice. I think the minimum donation is $1 a month. That's uh, 12 bucks for a year, which is pretty cheap, yep. I feel like. That's pretty good. Yep. Uh, but you can give more if you so desire. So we want to thank our 33 patrons. Yeah, everyone over at patreon.com slash Podcast. Thanks so much for the support. Thank you, Ian, for letting us know that you're one of our patrons. And Josh sent us a note, uh, sent a note to SVS after buying a PB12 and a steam. Let us know he heard about them from us. He made a cardboard box like we always advise. It is huge. So if you're looking at YouTube right <laughs> now, Rob has covered my moist face with the cardboard box of what his sub is going to look like. Now, I want... If you are looking at this, mm -hmm. you need to realize the what happened to this man after he built that box and put it in the corner. Yeah. He he went, oh, that's way bigger than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> yeah. And then he well, had to he... sit there for a very long time, I, I would guess, and come up with all the reasons how he was going to explain this purchase either to himself or to a significant other. Yeah. Now, see, that's or the both. PB12 NSD, which is the second smallest <laughs> ported sub. Okay, the, the sealed subs are definitely smaller, but that's the right, second right, right. smallest of the ported sub. So he even said uh, in his email, he's like, what the heck size is the PB16 Ultra, their largest ported box? And uh, as Austin big. will attest, <laughs> it is just slightly smaller than a 36-inch doorway. That's what a PB16 Ultra is looking at you, so. 
Uh, they have to take doorways into account. I think I have a 36 inch doorway, but I don't think I can make the turn in front of the couch. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Daniel gave us a shout out when he ordered his PB12 NSD from SVS. He went through our list of online speakers and got some ELAC debut towers as well. That's so a nice choice. That's kind of cool. A big thumbs up to yeah. that. And Tim also got a pair of SVS. <laughs> PB12 NSD subs during their sale. He gave us a shout out on Twitter. They dwarf his tiny, tiny Bic F12. And he also got a couple of SVS shirts packed in as a surprise from SVS as well. So that's pretty cool. I like this. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so the picture of the subs up in the upper right hand corner. You can have to look up there, but there is the Bic F12 up there cowering in fear of the two PB12 <laughs> NSDs. Now, the Bic F12, that's a 12-inch ported sub. That is not a tiny sub in just out-and-out -out terms. He's just like, oh, by comparison. Yes. So it's <laughs> yeah. The, it's like those two subs next to each other are a love seat. Yeah. They're the size of a love seat. Oh, yeah. A very big love seat. It's a comfortable completely love reasonable seat where you could sit three. Table. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very i think it's too tall to be a coffee table but yes it could, it's a very big coffee table so yeah that's uh i wonder if those are actually shirts or if they're just like the special little covers they put on the, the, the pp12s yeah these things are huge dude they are big but it's funny because we just talked about this last week didn't we yeah did we just talked oh, about no, last the, week? Yeah, the, the sale uh it, it went gangbusters so yeah, I guess so. So they uh, they ship real fast down there, too. That's so. right. All right. Thank you all to all of you who talked us up to these companies. We really appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you, guys. Let's get in the news here. Carl, the FCC approved its ATSC 3.0 broadcast standard for the USA. ATSC 3.0 transmissions are voluntary for broadcasters. And if they do switch over to, I'm not saying it again, they are required to still broadcast an ATSC 1.0 for at least five years. So 3.0 allows for 4K, HDR, and high frame rate broadcast, although none of those things are mandatory. And for North America, the audio format will be Dolby AC4, which can optionally include Atmos. Mm-hmm. I'm sure it's very poorly implemented at, at most, but there we go. Well, no, it'll be the, the Dolby Digital Plus lossy version of Atmos, but yeah. that's what you're getting from Vudu or Netflix. So uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, yeah, it's, um, I mean, I'm almost of the opinion that things do need to be mandatory for them to, like, happen. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, if, if you would like to check out the Cedia Tech Council podcast, they actually did a whole wow, special sounds... on ATSC 3.0 and really went into some of the details. So uh... sounds it sounds like it's extremely dynamic and very funny podcast. <laughs> it's it's it's, like it's a good podcast. A... I like listening to it. So yeah, I'm not saying it's not a good podcast. I'm just saying that the name of it is quite dry. <laughs> All right. Uh, Sony demonstrated their long awaited Dolby Division's firmware update for their A1 E Z9 D and X930 E X94. 940e TVs. All mm -hmm. right. So only models with the X1 Extreme video processing chips are capable of getting Dolby Vision update as far as existing Sony models go. And they still didn't give an exact date for when the update will be released to the public, but they said December. So which one is the Extreme video processing chips? Wait, are all those models have the All of those models oh. have it. Yeah, those are the models that have it. Those are essentially okay. their flagship models, right? So that's their, uh, their flagship okay. LCDs for 2017, their flagship LCD from 2016, which was the Z9D, and their OLED, which is the A1E. So it's their high end that have the X1 Extreme video processing chip. Uh, none of their other TVs can be upgraded to support Dolby Vision right this second. But I'm sure CES coming up soon in January, we're probably going to see a lot more models from Sony supporting Dolby Vision. That would be right. my my guess. I'm very disappointed that they didn't spell extreme with either uh, just an X uh -huh. or an exclamation My autocorrect point. tried to make it into just a capital X. <laughs> I'm like, Really? <laughs> That's, that's how often that gets done, I guess. Ascend Acoustics is running their holiday sale. $100 off Sierra 2 pairs and, uh, I'm sorry, CMT340 SE pairs for under $500. Bucks. Uh, the CBM170 SE pairs are for under $300 and some rhythmic subwoofer models on sale too. So there's some subs. So that's another, another uh, company that I speak about quite frequently. And if you'd like to perhaps get some of their speakers at a discount, holiday sale on now. So the uh, Rhythmic subwoofers are on sale through Ascend Acoustics? Yes, Ascend does not make their own subs. They partnered up with Rhythmic and said, uh -huh. we will sell Rhythmic subs because we like them and think they're a good value. And I agree with that assessment. And uh, so, yeah, they are a, uh, a retail partner for Rhythmic subwoofers. 
That's fine. Uh, every once in a while, SVS and other companies, HSU will do that as yeah. well, except for, for like receivers or something like that. They'll bundle in yeah. a receiver. All righty then. Um, something came to my mind when we were talking about this, and I just completely fell Folk out. Folk Albert? Have you heard second. them? They're still sitting over there on the ground. All right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, we ended up hosting Thanksgiving and, uh, yeah, no, didn't, I guess you're not happen. sending them back. Cause you know, it's going to be like past the return window by the time you actually hear them. I'm not sending them back. No. I mean, why would I send them back? I'm going to mount them to my ceiling. You can't well, assuming you like how so. they sound. That's, that's why I threw the boxes away, dude. I don't yeah. care anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Josh asked us which 75 inch TV he should buy for his completely non light controlled room. While it was still expensive, he got a big discount on a Sony 75X 940E. So he talked himself into it. And now you get the Dolby Vision. Update, You're going to get so. the Dolby Vision in a month or, or within the next month there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I did mention almost offhandedly that that is my absolute top choice for a 75 inch yeah. TV. Uh, I thought it would be too expensive, but he's like, well, you're throwing all the discounts going on right now. And it was it was within his grasp. So he talked to him, I don't think you'll be disappointed, Josh. Congratulations. That's a very nice TV. Yeah, so this Cyber Monday, and I'm trying to take a, and I'm remembering right now that I told my wife to check out the Amazon because I put something in the Amazon cart for my son. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, black, it's a Black Friday Monday, Cyber Monday, whatever the hell it is, Cyber Monday. Cyber Monday uh, deal, and I wanted her to click buy before, but uh, I forgot to tell her. Mm. And if I text her, she'll be mad. And I don't have my phone, anyways. All right, anyways. So remember last week, I was my I, I was saying that my friend was coming over, and that I after the podcast, I just ran out of here to go because yep. he was like invading my house. Uh, apparently, he was sitting in the he was sitting in the in my driveway. Watch, you know, listening or watching us on YouTube. Oh, really? So he, he walked in and said, "Boy, you guys talk about some geeky stuff." I'm like, "Exactly." That is a fair, exactly. a fair thing to say. It is. Let's get into the questions here. Let's geek it out, baby. This is going to be the uh, Wicked Witch of the West melting podcast. Andy, I'm I'm the Wicked Witch, by the way. Andy. Andy's house was a new construction. They paid extra to have 10-foot ceilings in the basement. It was a hefty sum. Mm -hmm. The basement is unfinished for now, but they plan on finishing the basement next year. They plan on keeping the basement fairly open and multi-purpose, of course. Andy wants to, but of course, Andy wants to install a 5.2.4 theater in a section of the open space. He's planning on just a single row of seats about 10, 12 feet from the screen. There are some ducting and pipe running along the ceiling joist just in front of where he figures he will install the screen. So we're looking at that now, are we? Yep, so yep. there's that. Yeah, the so there's ducting and be. piping that is uh, suspended from the joists of the ceiling there. Obviously, some portion of the ceiling will need to be lowered. You know, that would be like a, a long, low soffit, essentially, if you were doing it traditionally. So, uh, yes, yeah, so that will need to be covered. I like if you paid otherwise... a hefty sum to have your ceilings raised to 10 feet that you should not have things below 10 feet on your ceiling. I mean, I feel like... They, I mean, this is not... this is one of the things that's always um, intrigued me slash very much annoyed me about you hire an architect to design your house, but they, for some reason, don't account for where ducts and pipes need to go. And that is done like on site by those tradespeople. They're like, all right, here's the blueprints. How do we fit our ducts into here? I'm like, why don't architects build that into the plan? It's very... We've been building houses for a long time at this point. That is yeah. something that completely baffles me why it's still that way. It's very strange sometimes. Clear, I, mean, I mean, look at this. Clearly, you can't, you couldn't run this many pipes through those, whatever they're called, the header thingies or whatever, the big, yeah, the through big the, uh, the manufacturing Some of the electrical, there, yeah. yeah, some of those electrical wires look like they're going through, but you're not going to take those big old pipes. I mean, it's just going to structurally, <laughs> it's just not going to work. You put, like switch these yeah. up there. So surely that could have been taken into account so now you no longer have now you have an eight foot ceiling i guess this is good <laughs> if you hadn't done this I if mean, you hadn't said give me a 10 foot ceiling you would end up with uh an eight foot ceiling that would be six and a half feet right. by the well, time which you is get, which is what happens in a lot of people's in. a lot of people's basements right a lot of people's basements they have the minimum allowable clearance of six feet what is it six feet seven inches or six feet nine inches whatever it is in your jurisdiction a lot of people that is exactly what they have in their basement because from the floor to the joist is eight feet 
but then they had to put in right. pipes and ducting and you end up with a six foot nine ceiling and that's very common but yeah it's not like it's <laughs> the whole basement it's just this happens to be one section where that is going to be the case all right well you got to put a soffit over that thing uh somehow well that's that's actually the very first question so here we go so what should they do in terms of the ceiling for this basement? His wife wants a traditional drywall ceiling that will maximize the 10-foot height they paid for, and she figures a soffit to accommodate the ducting and piping is all they need. And he's curious about these drop ceilings we've been talking about lately, though. Oh, okay, I'm just going to say you right now. You lost this argument when your wife said she wanted drywall. You're not getting that <laughs> drop ceiling. But go on. Let's go on. Uh, especially be turning, uh, helpful in terms of soundproofing in any way. There's no way his wife will go for a ceiling that doesn't maximize the 10-foot height for the entire basement. But that, but just for the theater area, he might be able to convince her if we say it's really worth it. Would he just have a continuous 9 or 8-foot eight and a half foot ceiling uh for the entire theater if he goes with a drop ceiling do not i mean i don't really see why you would go i mean there are reasons to go for a drop ceiling right. in your theater area soundproofing is not one of them because you would have to do the whole right. thing yeah yeah you know you have to do the whole thing and then you're still I mean, it, it, you're gonna butt it up to that soffit probably right and then we're gonna do at the back have another soffit i guess I, or the, because it's an open area right this is what i'm talking that's what i'm understanding from this yeah, so you yeah, can have a drop ceiling just over the yeah just over that one section uh yeah no yeah it'd be a bit of a challenge i mean one of the the primary reason i really like a drop tile ceiling in essentially any theater but especially in a basement is if you need any kind of access then you have access um, you know, if, if you need to access the ducting or the plumbing for some reason, if you need to run additional wires right. at some point, if you don't start with ceiling speakers, but you want to install them later. And another key thing is if you're running additional electrical at any point by code, you must have access to any junctions. Junctions must be accessible, but you're allowed to put a junction above a drop tile ceiling without an exposed electrical box because it's still accessible. All you have to do is move a tile out of the way and you can get to that junction so there's lots of convenience reasons for using a drop tile ceiling then i like to i i don't actually think they're better for soundproofing they're just not worse because that's the concern a lot of people bring up whenever i suggest a drop tile ceiling a lot of people say oh isn't sound gonna leak through that super easy and if you get the one thirty second of an inch thick tiles then yes of course you're essentially putting a piece of plastic or paper up there but if you get a proper acoustic ceiling tile the, and you put insulation above it then no so what i'm usually trying to convince people is that it is not worse for soundproofing and that because it's automatically decoupled and a continuous surface that it isn't a problem for soundproofing but if you already know you're going to have ceiling speakers installed, you can prepare for that with your drywall ceiling. If you know you want soundproofing, then you can use two layers with green glue or you can install sound clips with hat channels. Uh, you know, you can you can prepare yourself to soundproof it with a drywall ceiling. So you're less it's less accessible above drywall, of course. But you can still plan this out to be soundproof, have your uh, uh, your in-ceiling speakers where you want them to be, have your wires run where you want them to be. And yes, a soffit completely makes sense. That's what you would do. And obviously any builder, anybody who's uh, you know competent for finishing your basement is going to know how to do it with drywall. So I'm not concerned about that. Uh, so I agree with your wife here. You know, I wouldn't want to sacrifice the 10 foot height that you paid for. Yes, you're going to install a soffit. And since you already know you want ceiling speakers, you can plan ahead for that. Right. Uh, I understand half of, I want to say 75% of what Rob just said because it was all robot. Yeah, so I know. I, yeah. I, it, 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 I'm blaming my family right now, but it's they're going to be going to bed pretty soon. So hopefully this will straighten itself out. But I'm assuming what you're saying is that, you know, we can fix this without having to do the drop, what he's trying to do without the drop ceiling. Now, you already know where your speakers are going to go, or we're going to tell you, uh, and you can run, you know, conduit to each of those yes. places that you want. Uh, and then once you've done that, then you've got this big soffit up the, up front where you can run speaker wire or, you know, whatever. That's going to be at the front, though, right? It's going to be at the front? It will be, yeah, so, in front of the screen, yeah. But you can run your speaker wire up there for your height speakers or whatever you're going to do up there. You know, you can actually install those into your, um, into your soffit. 
if it happens to work out that that's a good place for him. So, you know, we can make this work, but I don't see any, any cause. This is way more marital strife than is warranted for what the benefits you would get for a drop ceiling. So we asked, what should they do when it comes to the display? Since the room will be multi-purpose, it might not always be pitch black, although they're down there, if they're down there specifically to watch a movie, they'll certainly be able to turn the lights out. Should they go for a flat panel and then also have a projection screen that rolls down in front of it? Or should just get a projection screen and forget about the dual display setup? Any flat panel they install would be 65 inches max. So should he maybe forego the flat panel and then, and spend that money on a better screen and projector? Why 65 inches? Max? Yeah, I didn't quite understand that either. I'm like, I, there there are affordable what, 75 inches, like a Vizio M series, say, is quite an affordable 75 inch screen. So I'm not. I uh, I don't get sure. that at all. Uh, well, because the answer to your question is how close are you going to sit to your screen? Right. Because you're only sitting in a specific area, so you want you're, you're really looking for field of view. So if your field of view is going to you were looking for 35, 40, you know, degrees field of view, then, you know, you have to, you, and you say, I'm sitting this close. This means that I need this big of a screen. Well, if that big of a screen comes in the flat panel, get the flat panel. I well, mean, they're going to, but he's, he's saying he's going to be 11 or 12 feet away from that front wall. Uh, so yeah, to even get to a 30 degree field of view, you're up into the 85, 90 inch range. <laughs> right. So I guess it, my question, because I don't think we can answer this question yet. My question back to you is when you're not watching a movie and maybe the mm. lights aren't on, what are you watching and how much do you care about how it looks? You know, if you're down there in this multipurpose room playing pool and your kids are watching, you know, Netflix or some movie and the lights are on, it sort of washes out the screen, I guarantee you the kids don't care. So <laughs> therefore, you don't care, right? But if there's going to be times when, like, I don't know, there's something going on in part of that house, or that part of that basement, but you're still trying to seriously watch, you know, the dark night rises. Mm. Well, then, yeah, you're going to maybe want to have a dual setup. But you're never going to be happy with that 65 inch if that's your max you're never going to be happy with that 65 inch screen not if you have to i mean it's going to look so tiny compared to your projection screen i i don't really see any reason to get one i i think you should just get like a i really think you should just get a normal projector and set up and just tell people to turn the lights out whenever you're trying to watch stuff <laughs> yeah i mean i i wouldn't uh, so so first of all if you are going to have this uh, 10 to 11 foot viewing distance then yeah you'd want your flat panel to be north of 80 inches i mean ideally yeah. you know just just for viewing angle that's that's what you would prefer to he's have he's 11 that. feet away is that what you said yeah yeah he's, he's yeah, be between dude, 10 and 11 you gotta go feet. 90 plus minimum well i mean that that would be I'm... if it were for your movies right for hdtv yeah. for games you're looking at your 30 to 32 degree field of view he's in the 80 to 85 inch screen range which is not impossible but that that starts getting pretty spendy as soon as you go above 75 i mean 75 yeah. wouldn't be horrible but 65 65 is too small 60, too 65 isn't worth your while. So I'm not sure why he mentioned that 65 inches is as large as they would ever consider for a flat panel, but let's just take him at his word. If that's the case, I'm going to say that's too small. Don't spend it on that. I wouldn't object to him possibly getting an ambient light rejecting screen. That that wouldn't be the worst possible use of that money. If, I mean, I, I want to know before, he, before we recommend that, how much of this time is he going to spend in the dark versus not yeah. in the dark? Yeah. Yeah. You know, because that's going to, that's, uh, I am, I, you know me, I do not like light rejecting screens. I just yeah. I think that they're more trouble than they're worth. <laughs> and uh, especially when people are like, well, you know, sometimes we're going to watch a game during the day. Like, okay. You mean, you're, so you're going to compromise your viewing experience at all the other times of the year when you're watching <laughs> stuff at night for that, for the Super Bowl? Which is usually at, well, it depends on which coast you live on, but you know, you know, or you know that occasional bowl game, or you know Thanksgiving, or something like that. You're going to ruin the because believe <laughs> me, you're the only one that cares about it, anyways. Everybody else will be like, "That's a really big screen, mm. boy. It's there's a lot of base in here. No one is going to look at your thing and say, oh, well, you know, colors are kind of washed out.'" Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I will say though that the you know elite screens newest, uh, they call it their Cinegray 5D. I don't yeah. sure why it's 5D, but uh, Cinegray 5D from Too Elite Screens, it, it's it's fairly, it, it's it's really quite affordable. It does a pretty decent job, particularly at light coming from directly overhead. 
Um, that's sort of what they made it for. So if you're concerned about, you know, you're going to have maybe light in that soffit or something firing downward, it's actually kind of designed for that scenario. Hmm. So I'll, I'll throw it out there to you, but we're in agreement here that a 65 inch flat panel doesn't make sense here. Don't do that. So yeah. either get bigger I mean, 75 really wouldn't be too bad, especially if you're 10 feet away instead of 11. So 75 inches. I was going to say, can you cheat those fishes forward yeah, a little bit? You know, 75 you know? inches from 10 feet away, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be on board with that. That I would give serious consideration, like a 75 inch M series sitting 10 feet away, and then you have a projector screen that comes down in front of that. I'm like, and remember, if you're, yeah. if you, you can actually make that happen pretty easily. Yeah. If you just say, I'm not going to wall mount this thing. I would, I, I'm going to put all my equipment up in this, in this nice cabinet that we're going to buy. Mm -hmm. We'll put it and put the thing on it, and then that's at least a foot off the wall. Well, yeah, you get so one, there, you there's get, a foot closer, anyways. You get one of those three in one stands, you know, that actually, yeah. like, it has a wall mount, but it's attached to the stand instead of actually on the wall. Right. Yeah. That that could be that could be very doable. So yeah, uh, well, there you go. We're we're saying either get a bigger flat panel or don't bother. <laughs> yeah that's what that's what we think ian so ian recently upgraded his theater he picked up four used theater seats for 100 bucks wow that's not pretty good mm -hmm. so he now has two rows of seats he installed a second pair of side surrounds so then now there's a pair of side surrounds for each row of seats and he expanded to atmos so now he has a 5.1.4 configuration yes tom he knows it should be 5.2.4 <laughs> you are correct sir technically it's like 7.2.4 now that you've but it's really the five channels just split that's correct ones. but anyways this past summer, he asked us about getting a gigantic screen so that he could use that he could use in his backyard, and he had considered a screen that was about sixteen feet wide, and nine feet tall. I remember this guy. Yeah. But he heated our decided, decided to heed our advice of just because you can doesn't mean you should, and focused on something smaller and more manageable. The experience left him wanting a larger projection screen for his theater, though. <laughs> Just think if you had gotten the real big one. Like, just think if you had gotten the real big one. How the situation? We have saved you, sir. You are welcome. Uh, and he'd like to upgrade his uh, Epson 80. Uh, 8350 projector as well. So Ian is visually impaired. All right, so that's another reason why he wants a big screen. So resolution and sharpness are less of a concern to him than contrast, color, and sheer size. Will the Epson 5040UB uh, be a really noticeable upgrade over his 8350? Well, we, how big of a screen is he going to? We don't know that yet. You, well, that that's first, coming up right? next. He's, he's going to a, maybe 160 inches is what he's thinking. Okay. From 120. 160. Well, 160, you need a uh, projector that can handle that. A lot of projectors can't handle 100. Well, they can. But they start to lose brightness pretty in contrast pretty quickly after uh, about 135, right? I mean, generally speaking. Well, I mean, that's, well, that's one of his questions, to too. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, well, why are these questions not in the right order then? Well, uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm, I was going a little bit by the way that he asked them in his email, tried to reorganize. But that's fine. The Epson 5040UB is without question an upgrade over the 8350 in every conceivable way. Um, well, there you go. Now, if, if your eyesight isn't the best, are you going to care about the wobble K versus it just being 1080p? Definitely not. Nope. In fact, you're probably not going to care about that if you have 2020 vision. But the black levels are definitely blacker. The contrast is definitely higher. It is brighter, even though the 8350 is already quite a bright projector. And if you want it to, it has a DCI filter to give you the full P3 color gamut, which the 8350 cannot touch. So in mm. every way that you've mentioned, it is without question an upgrade. Um, yeah, I, I would be quite shocked if you would replace an 8350 with a 5040UB and not notice a difference. That would be next to impossible. <laughs> yeah. All right, so his current screen is 120. We just talked about that. Uh, and it's a manual pull-down. He's considering upgrading to a screen that's 140 inches wide, which would be 160 inches diagonal. Rob already said that. Uh, still a roll-down one. Mm -hmm. But he'd like it to be acoustically transparent with all three of his front speakers behind the screen. So he's considering Seymour AV. Seymour AV offers roll-down screens with motorized masking, but it isn't four-way masking. You either mask off just the top, to turn the 16 by 9 to a 2.35 to 1, or you can mask off the left and right size to put, turn a 2.35 to 1 to a 16 by 9. So, Ewan would like to be able to show 16 by 9 images, 2.35 to 1 images, and IMAX images. Isn't IMAX just 2.16 by 9? It is, but it's is it bigger, 16 by 9. So he's saying he'd like 16 by 9 in an HD TV size, 2.35 uh, to 1, which is the same height as that HD TV size, but wider. 
and then IMAX, which is the same width as the 2.35 to 1, but taller. So it's the three screen okay. sizes thing. That's what he's hoping to achieve. So anyways, he was thinking he could get this 160-inch, uh, 16 by 9 screen with left and right side masking for uh, only a 2.35 to 1 portion is still visible. Wait a second. I think you skipped a for, line. Uh, I'm sorry. I skipped a line. <laughs> uh, right, right, uh, left and right side masking. For IMAX, he used the full screen. For 2.35 to 1, he could partially roll up the screen so that only 2.35 to 1 portion is still visible. I mean, the black bars from the projector wouldn't get projected onto his wall below the screen and onto the screen's case above the screen. It, and it would. That's, the that's where the black TV bars contact. would go. Yeah. Right. That's where they would go. And then for the HDTV content, he could drop the side mask on this 2.35 to 1 partial roll down position. Does this sound like the best approach or can we think of a better way? Yeah, I don't... Two point okay. That was basically going to be my recommendation, which was the side masking because you could side mask off the 16 by 9. But is that they actually work? Because it's it's sixteen by nine, but smaller, right? Is yeah. So the, I'm a little, I got confused. Yeah. So the issue is, so, so obviously for IMAX the IMAX, six, yeah, yeah, that makes Go sense. Ahead. IMAX is going to be 160 inches diagonal, sixteen by nine aspect ratio. That that is the full screen. That is the whole screen, all of it. That is your IMAX. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Then he's saying for two point okay. three five to one, he's just going to roll it up. So it's going to yeah, be pretty high. That. It's going to be pretty right. high. That's my little bit of a concern. It's going to be pretty high. And then he's like, okay, now he's got this 2.35 to 1 screen. Then he masks off the sides of that to create a small, or quote unquote small, but a small 16 by 9 image. But that's going to be up high, right? Because he's rolled the whole thing up. Why, why, why are we wasting all of this screen on the... the 15 seconds of IMAX that we're going to see in the occasional movie. Why? I mean, shouldn't we just have 16 by 9 be 16 by 9 all the time, the 100, full 160 inches, and then put the top and de put the top masking for 2.35 to 1, and then... No, because he wants, wants 2.35 to 1 to be bigger than HDTV. That's the desire. That, I mean, that's the whole point of a constant... There is a large portion of the audience that's that's having the same thought process I'm having right now and understanding the words you're saying, but not understanding why you're saying them. I mean, I, that's I see what you're That's the whole point of constant image height, though. The whole point of constant image height is that you have your HDTV and then the screen gets bigger for movies, not smaller. That's what people yeah. don't like about watching 2.35 to 1 movies on a flat panel is that movies, mm -hmm. big cinematic movies, are actually smaller than their TV shows. Mm -hmm. Their TV shows fill the whole 16 by 9 screen, then black bars get come in and make the screen smaller for their big cinematic mm -hmm. movies. The whole idea with the projection is that your cinematic movies are bigger than your TV. That's what he's trying to achieve, which is something I, I agree I understand. With. Yeah. So, okay, I... I I, I don't, but go on. So, I mean, you, you, if you're saying that don't care about IMAX, then the solution is simple. Get a 2.35 to 1 screen with side masking. Because then yeah. when you're watching 16 by 9, it's smaller with the side masks in place. When you watch a cinematic movie, you raise the side masks and you have your 2.35 to 1 screen sitting there. And there it is. He's saying the same thing that I consider, which is that I do like some of these IMAX features and I want them to be even bigger than my 2.35 to 1 movies. Or sometimes I'm watching a movie with subtitles that gets placed into the black bar, which is annoying, but sometimes that's the way it is. I don't completely like his proposal because I think it's going to end up with the 2.35 to 1 and the HDTV stuff being too high, too high up. You're going to have to be looking up at it. I don't particularly like yeah. that. I see a couple of very simple solutions to this. First All right, solution. I'd like to I'd like to hear this because my solution is even simpler than that. But go on. First solution, he now has two rows of seats. So when mm -hmm. it's HDTV time, you move to the second row. Okay. Right? So it's what you're proposing, which is when it's 16 by 9, you just fill the whole 160-inch screen, except you, the viewer, move farther back to your second row, making a smaller field of view. When it's 2.35 to 1, you sit in your front row, and to you, the image got bigger because you physically moved forward in the room to your first row of seats. That's my simple solution to this. 
is you get the big 60, you get the 160 inch 16 by nine screen. You actually get the top masking, not the side masking. We're not gonna ever mask the sides. You get the top masking so that you can mask it off to be 2.35 to one when you want it to be that. And then when it's HDTV time and you want a smaller 16 by nine field of view, you go sit in your second row. The second solution I would have is you already own a 120 inch screen. You don't have to take it down. You could have two screens. You have your 120 inch screen That's... for HDTV. Then you have your 160 inch screen for IMAX with top masking. So you can turn it into a 2.35 to one. Why get rid of the screen you already have? It's actually the exact size that would occur if he dropped the side masking and created the smaller 16 by nine within the 160 inch. The smaller 16 by nine is 120 inches, which is the exact screen he already owns. So either do two screens, because you already own one, or just go sit in your second row. That's my two solutions. All right, I like that second one better than the first one, because okay. the first one sounds like uh, insanity to me. I can't <laughs> fathom the idea of wanting to not use all 160 inches every chance I got. Okay. I, I can't imagine paying for it and going, nah, I want it to be smaller when it's HGTV. Like the majority of stuff I watch is HGTV, right? Yes. I mean, the majority of of everything is HGTV yep. that we, you watch on Netflix or whatever it is, anything you're streaming. Mm -hmm. uh, most movies, you know, or not most, but lots of movies. Uh, I just can't fathom going, no, I want that's too big. I want that to be smaller. I'm like, no, I want the whole thing. Okay, fine. <laughs> Either do the second thing or just get the 16 by 9 and uh, and the top masking, which is what I would do. Okay. And not ever worry about that. I, I just... So when you... Let, let me just ask you a question, Rob. This is... Yes. When you watch The Dark Knight Returns, do you stop the movie so that you could change the masking for that little pan shot uh, that's IMAX of him standing on top of that building and then stop the movie again to change the the aspect ratio of the no, mask no, no. I just, back I just, to for, for those movies I would just live the, with the black bars you're going to have the whole 160 inch screen open for something that has IMAX portions the whole screen is going to be open there will be black bars during the 2.35 to 1 sections I'm not going to so outside of actual IMAX movies like movies right. that were shot for IMAX like all those documentaries sure. and the speed movies and all that stuff how many movies are out there right now where the entire thing is shot in IMAX okay. do you reckon I'm, I'm asking oh the entire That's thing I, I'm not sure it's it's not that many you can look up the IMAX titles that are available on Blu-ray and Ultra HD Blu-ray there's I don't know maybe I'm talking about like you know like normal like normal movies like you know something that would be a, a a big blockbuster Marvel something I mean or any of that stuff or even I mean the art house stuff for sure wouldn't it be because the IMAX cameras are yeah. forever expensive but no well none none of them have been shot entirely I, I just, in IMAX the the you know yeah so basically the only time this IMAX format is used is either in specific shots in like. Batman movies with what's his name Nolan as the director. Yeah, Christopher Nolan. Yeah, or... like Don Kirk, right? Don Kirk. Okay, so there's one. But that, not that whole, that whole movie is not in IMAX. No, but seventy five percent of it is. So again, with that movie, you'd be living with the black bars. I mean, this is yes. just between me, you, you and yeah. Okay. So it's really only for actual IMAX documentary things that this whole. This whole scenario that you've laid out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's only for things that were shot in IMAX. That's what I want the huge 16 by 9 for. Yeah. All right. I, I still don't get it. I feel like I, I feel like we're both speaking English at each it's other. That and, and he, subtitles, because there's lots of movies where they put the subtitles into the lower black bar. So if you only have a 2.35 to 1 screen, you can't see the subtitles or part of the them is The solution is a 16 by 9 and just live with the black bars. That is the solution. That is literally the solution. So, what, what, so okay. what's the problem? If I'm saying I want the 16 by 9 for IMAX, the only issue is that I don't want my HD TV to be larger than my cinema scope. That is where you stop making sense. Yeah. I don't understand no, why you don't want that. The whole point of constant image height is that your HD TV is smaller than your cinema scope. I hear That's those words. Thing. I hear them. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that you're a crazy person. I'm saying that I think you're a crazy person a little bit. But that's okay. All right. 
I'm not insulting you. I don't want that. I know this is going to negative place. I'm just like, I just, I, I, I that just does not register to me as hey. something I under, I would want. But that's good. Fine. Okay. We're on the same page here. I please vote on who's right on this. I want my movies. I want my movies to be bigger than my television. That's I got it. No, I as that. got it. I a hundred percent got it. I a hundred percent got it. According to Projector Central's calculator, even with the 160-inch screen size, the 5040 UB should be able to achieve 30-foot Lamberts, which would match the cinema standard for HDR. And when he shrinks it down smaller, the 120-inch 16 by 9 size, it should be able to hit over 150. I'm sorry, over 50-foot Lamberts. He'd like to be able to use that smaller screen size with a little bit of ambient light. So he's just double-checking: is the 5040 UB bright enough for those scenarios? The real question is: does the 5040 have uh, memory on its lens? It sure does. Yes, it has lens because, memory. Yeah, that's absolutely that's that's a hundred percent what you need. So if it's got that, then fifty foot. I mean, I don't. I can't look at look at fifty foot Lamberts and tell you what it's going to be. Uh, a little bit of ambient light. A little bit. What's a little bit? Because a little bit in the okay. The big difference for me about ambient light is not the amount of it. It's the directionality of mm -hmm. it. Okay. If you've got a little bit of light in your room, like your whole room is a little bit lit, lit up. Your whole screen is a little bit washed out. My whole screen being a little bit washed out does not bother me as much as somebody opening a door and there being a streak of light across the mm. screen. That will drive me 100% up the wall all day long and twice on Sunday. If it's just going to, if it's just like sometimes we're watching it and it's still a little, you know, the sun's still setting, I would not worry about it no matter what the foot Lamberts were. But if it's going to be, you know, you know there, there's going to be a huge amount of light coming from one direction, well, then that's when we have to start talking about this. So what's the answer to the question? Uh, yeah, so just to work out the math, 30-foot Lamberts on a 160-inch screen would require 2,300 lumens. Uh, that's how much the projector would have to be outputting. And the 5040UB, according to Projector Central and Projector Reviews, who measured the light output, it really can genuinely produce 2,400 lumens in its bright cinema mode, which actually still has pretty accurate color. Uh, you would right. have to put it into the high lamp mode, and you would ideally place the projector closer to the screen rather than farther away. Although in his case, where the depth of the whole room is only about 12 feet, that's not really going to be an option. He's going to have to put it closer to the uh, to the uh, wide angle side of things anyway. Um, but yeah, it, it can do this. Now, the one little caveat is that the bright cinema mode does not have the DCI P3 color filter in place. Because mm. when you put that color filter in place, it drops the lumen output that's under right, the sure. digital cinema picture mode. That's the one that puts that DCI P3 color in place. Easy to remember because digital cinema and it's digital cinema color. That's what you're going for. And it basically cuts the light output in half when you put that up there. So if you were to use the digital cinema picture mode, no, it would not be bright enough. Although it'd be bright enough for standard dynamic range, even on a 160 inch screen because you cut it in half and that's exactly where standard dynamic range would be. So either way, you have a choice here. You could choose to have the wider DCI P3 color with standard dynamic range, or you could forego the wider color to get the full 30 foot Lamberts even on your entire 160 inch screen. So short answer, yes, it is bright enough. What about the ambient light part of it? Because that was 50 foot Lamberts he was saying. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, if, if 100... you do continue to use your 120 inch screen, uh, yeah, I mean, you're, 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 you can hit upwards of 60 foot Lamberts on that thing if you, if you want to crank right. it into the bright cinema mode. So lots of light output. Your black level is what's going to get washed out by the ambient light. Right, so sure. you're not going to want to watch something that's all darkness all the time because that's going to look washed out. But you got lots of light up. It's a light cannon. You got lots of light. So you're going to want to test that, basically. You're going mm -hmm. to test both modes and figure out which one you want the high dynamic range or if you want the the extra brightness. Uh, or extra color gamut, I mean. So if he uses a 2.35 to 1 partial screen, the black bars are physically being projected onto the wall below and, and the case and above. Will that act a, a little bit like a bias light? No. Nope. <laughs> Not even a little bit. No, you're projecting blackness onto the wall. Basically, bias lighting is actual lighting. I mean, it's a light. Yeah, <laughs> so, if the black yeah. bars were light enough to be visible, then that would mean 
everything that is supposed to be black (laughs) is that light and gray. Yeah. That ain't what you want. So either it looks horrible, which would be the opposite of a bias light, or you don't see those black bars, I mean, if at all, barely at all, which means they're not a bias light. So either way, no. We're already already recommending not doing that anyway. That's correct, yeah. Yeah. So he has a Harmony remote, and he knows the 5040UB incl- includes lens memory, and then the Seymour AV screens can be programmed to drop it to specific heights and drop the masking separate from the screen. But will it really be as simple as hitting a single button on his Harmony remote? How reliable are the memory settings on the projector on the screen? Well, it will definitely be as easy as hitting a single button on your on your Harmony. You can always yes. set up a macro button that yeah. will, you're like, I'm watching 2.35 to 1. Boom, hit it. Yeah, they call it a sequence. It's, it's called a yeah. sequence, but you can program a sequence with multiple commands that get sent out. So you can have every combination that you want, right? It's now it's 2.35 to 1 with my projector in HDR mode. Now it's 2.35 to 1 with my projector in SDR mode. Now it's small 16 yeah. by 9 HDR mode. Every combination, you can create a sequence for that. You hit the button on your Harmony and it sets all of these things to where they're supposed to be. Right. Uh, it was- so how reliable the uh, memory settings on the projector and the screen? Well, it's really, it, it might take a little bit of uh, trial and error on your part, but generally speaking, I find these things work really well as long as you are reaching the IR input on whatever it is. So uh, more times than not, with if you're having problems with things working the way they should, it's usually because the signal is not is being physically blocked. The IR is being blocked. Mm-hmm. So you need to add one of the blasters in or more directly connect it to the hub, that sort of thing. But most of the time, these works pretty good. The one problem you may run into is if it turns out that, you know, your projector takes a little bit longer to warm up sometimes and other times and that sort of thing. Like I've noticed with the projector I'm using currently, which is an Epson, uh, it will, uh, like sometimes it pops right on and sometimes it like goes through some sort of cycle where it cleans itself or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it's doing. And therefore, you may have to put a delay into these, into mm-hmm. between some of the actions. And you'll that's really easy to do. It's very, you can see the sequence of what's happening. You're like, add a delay here, add another yep. delay yep. here, you know, whatever. And, uh, but that's that, that I anticipate being your only issue, and that may never come up. Yeah, setting so. up the sequence is the first time. Definitely could involve some trial and error back and forth, right. programming the remote. But once it's done, I mean, if, if you're literally worried about a single pixel being overshot onto the frame of the screen or something like that, Yes, that can occur. It might not be literally down to the 4K pixel size, but you said you didn't really care as much about resolution and image sharpness because you have some visual impairment anyway. I really highly doubt that one or two pixels off is going to be the end of the world to you. That's really all we're talking about here is, is like one or two pixels at most when the when yeah. the lens memory moves. So it's it's darn reliable. Yeah. yeah. So we asked, will you need a separate calibration for each image size? I don't see why you would. I mean... Well, I mean, you you certainly need separate for HDR versus SDR. Yeah, but you don't need it for, uh, you know, going from 16 by 9 to 2.35 to 1. I mean, no, not that, unless that an issue. Un- unless you want a ambient light is present mode versus we're in darkness mode. Yeah. Right? For that, you might want to. But again, I mean, you're, not really yeah, that yeah, difficult yeah. because there's lots of picture presets available to store as memory. So it's simply a matter of, this is the picture preset I'm gonna use when I want it for, there's some ambient light and I still want HDR. So I'm gonna use this picture mode. And then it's pitch blackness and I want HDR. So I'm gonna use this other picture mode. And then I want SDR with ambient light and SDR without ambient light. So you could set up four picture modes to do that. Still not that hard. So lastly, his uh, front windows are behind where a screen comes down. So that's why the screen needs to be retractable no matter what. He'd really like some motorized shades to go over those windows, though. So any suggestions for that? Mm-hmm. I do not. But it does beg the question. Both these screens he's been looking at, I think, are manual? No, downs? no, no. The Seymour is motorized. The, the, the one Seymour he already is owns. motorized. Yeah, the okay. one he already owns is manual, but uh, the Seymour is motorized. Okay. So yeah, well, I, I read the Seymour offers roll-down screens. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, he's just going to get another pull-down. All right. Yeah. So this is going to be really slick because mm-hmm. when you turn on your... Uh, your your system, your your harmony. You're, you're going to say no matter you're, the first thing that you do, and every every time I turn something on is 
close the windows mm-hmm. and close the, close, the, close the shades. That's right. Which is pretty cool. Uh, and then you'll have to decide afterwards whether or not you want those shades open or not afterwards. Mm-hmm. You know, there may be a situation where you don't want them or you do want them. So I don't know. what we. I've never actually looked up uh, motorized screen shades before because once I have... <laughs> Once I've closed those shades, I, I don't. That's the. That, I don't mind doing that manually. I do that all the time manually. So. Well, yeah. I'm going to rely on uh, something that uh, Richard Gunther and uh, Josh Pollard over at uh, Digital Media Zone have been recommending for a long time, which is uh, it's called Serena Shades, and it's by Lutron. So lots of people know okay. Lutron as a lighting company, a home automation company, uh, but they have a specific a line, series of shades that are called the Serena Shades. Now they're actually battery powered, uh, but that's kind of nice because then you don't have to have a electrical cord traipsing or wire through the walls. Uh, and the batteries last a good long time, so it's not like you're changing the batteries all the time. Uh, but they're battery-powered, they're reasonably affordable, and being that they're from Lutron, they will completely work with your Harmony remote. So just like Tom said, this can be really nice and slick. You hit a button, those shades come down, those shades go up, however you want to control them. You can do it from an app on your smartphone too. So uh, they're affordable, battery-powered, Serena shades from Lutron. I'm trying to see how much they cost. Ah, <laughs> oh, you can get them at Lowe's and Home Depot, yeah. too. So you just go to your local Lowe's. There yeah. you go. All right. Done with that one. That was a long one. Ted. We haven't talked to Ted in a while. This is a different Ted, interesting. though. This is Ted, a different Ted? This is Ted T, not Ted M. Oh, I didn't even Different Ted. I was going to say maybe he doesn't like his legacy audio speakers now. We're going to have to help him shop for new speakers. <laughs> or maybe he's going for subwoofer number five. Could be. Uh, Ted T, different Ted. In object-based audio like Atmos, does the object processing extend into the floor level speakers or is it only using the overhead channels? Oh, that's a good question. So in object level, it should be all the speakers, right? Well, let me think about this. <laughs> Because they're the, they they have the channels, and then uh, which are individual, mm-hmm. and then the overhead stuff is metadata. Well, you have wow, two wow. overhead channels, so you you get nine channels in right. the Atmos system for the home. You get nine mm-hmm. channels, which means if you want to say this sound gets played out of this speaker, you use the channels. But if you just want to move a sound around in full three dimensional space. You create it as an object with metadata attached to it. Uh, so there's all those channels then. Yay. Yes, yeah, so you can absolutely have objects in the floor level channels. That is how front wide speakers or surround two or uh, center back, which are all possible speaker placements that you could have if uh, you have like a Trinov, you know, altitude 32. Yeah. It can put in right, all right. of these uh, at most positions, well, there are no channels for those extra positions, but objects that are panning through those positions can absolutely play. play. Now, how often is it actually used in the mix? That's highly questionable, and I don't really know how to confirm. Uh, you know how often objects are being used in the floor level speaker mix because that's that's up to the the mixers and the masters. It's up to them whether they use it or not. But can it be? Absolutely, yes. Right, but once you put something as an object in the room, isn't it up to the processing to decide which speaker it comes out of, even the floor level speakers? Or are the floor level still built as the channels and then the metadata is the does way, not play out? Yeah, the way the, it's done the at home, level. they still they have kind of like two separate levels. It's like if an object exists in the height level, it just stays in the height level. It doesn't drop down into the floor speaker level and vice versa. Right, so right. they do kind of have right. this separation in the in the home version, but you can have objects. So, for instance, if you wanted an object that goes high, low, back and forth, you'd kind of have to mix that carefully and go back and forth between the two layers. Right. But you can still do it. So basically, the answer to his question, though, is that Atmos is only in the overhead speakers. The object level part of it is only in the overhead speakers because the 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 floor level speakers, while they can be mixed into at most with something like a Trinov with a normal receiver that's still channel based on the floor. No, no. You can have objects. It's just you have two layers of objects. That's all. Uh, a floor okay. level object or a height level object. If you want to move between the two layers, you just have to mix it carefully. But you can absolutely have objects in the floor layer. Yes, you can. 
Okay. So Ted has a 20 by 20 by 8 foot room. He's planning to put four recliners arranged in the arc uh, about 10 feet from the TV. Wow, acoustically not so swell. He has seven speaker craft and ceiling speakers on hand that he can use for overhead speakers. Is there a layout for overhead speakers that would sound good for both Atmos and Oro 3D? The speakers are aimable up to 30 degrees off axis, but that helps. So uh, do we know where they are? I mean, there's, he just says there's seven speakers yeah, I don't know if they're already in there or if he just owns them and can put them where he wants. I mean, I assume he's willing to move them if they are already installed because he's like, what's the layout? I would not assume that. I mean, why wouldn't he? Get, well, maybe, well okay, because let's, he's let's, asking, let's, let's, is there something that's compatible for both? So if they're not where they already need to be, what what good is answering that question? Okay, so he, <laughs> he it depends on where you end up. So he's going to use these for Atmos, so an overhead. So he's going to use, uh, wow. No, to be I, to be I, Atmos and Oro 3D, it must be front heights and right. rear heights. Front heights right. and rear heights is the only configuration that is compatible with both of those formats. They must be so labeled as front heights and rear heights. That's four of your speakers, so that you just have to you will have to figure out the angles to figure out where those are, and then you're going to put one speaker above you for the voice of God for Atmos. That's uh, for, for Oro 3D. 3D. Yeah, and that's it. So you have, you got two extra speakers. Basically. Yeah, two two will be left over, but that's fine. Uh, he's just saying he already owns them. Now, yeah. Oro wants you to have your front height speakers at a 30 degree elevation, and they want you to have your rear height speakers at a 30 degree elevation behind you. Now, he's got an eight foot ceiling. I'm going to assume the typical, you're about three feet off the ground, meaning there's about five feet from your ears to the ceiling. So 30 degrees to create the 30 degree elevation angle, you would want the front height speakers to be essentially eight and a half feet in front of you, and the rear height speakers to be eight and a half feet behind you. Now, physically, that's possible. and It should be, yeah. And uh, it, even though I rarely recommend angling in-ceiling speakers, in that instance, I would. Because to, to have them aimed right at you, they'd actually need to be able to swivel 60 degrees. Right? Uh, so, so if you swung them the whole 30 degrees that they're able to swivel, uh, then at least you're within the 30 degree off axis response of that in, in yeah. the speaker if you put them that far forward. Now, that's what Oro 3D would ideally like you to have, but front height and rear height speakers can be as much as a 45 degree elevation angle. That, that's allowable. It's anywhere from 30 to 45 degrees elevation. Now, that would only be five feet in front of you and five feet behind you. So the real answer is somewhere between five and eight and a half feet in front of you, somewhere between five and eight and a half feet behind you. You must call them front heights and rear heights, but that's the setup. Yeah, and I this whole aiming the tweeter thing, uh, or aiming the speaker, I think you can name the, probably the whole speaker with Could speakercraft. Could be, yeah. Uh, with those, I would recommend shooting them straight down to begin with, then straight as far towards you as personally as, as yeah, possible. Yeah, give it a try, yeah. And then see which one you like. I don't think that there's much point in doing something in between. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't really think that there's going to be much much point doing a, something in between. It's either going to found, sound fine one way or sound better the other way, and that'll be it. Uh, but try them both, since you you ha it's usually just a matter of taking the grill off and yeah, or yeah. maybe even physically just wrote you know turning the things. So lastly, ask why do we hate pol hate on Polk so much? <laughs> I'm sorry that you like Polk speakers, dude, and or that you own them, but we don't hate them. And the fact that we don't praise them as much as some people would like is not the same thing as ha as hate. Yes, welcome to it's the internet where if you don't recommend something as your number one choice, it means you hate it. Yeah, I, like, I I'm indifferent about Polk. They some their their offerings are sometimes fine mm -hmm. and sometimes not so fine, but most of the time I can find for the same money I could spend on a polk I could find something better. That exactly. doesn't mean I don't like polk. It just means that dollar for dollar I would rather spend my money on something that gives me better value. That's exactly and it. I th that's 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 all it comes down to. That's not hate. I don't hate polk. I don't really care. If you own polk and you love them, I do not think you're a bad person. Absolutely I do not. not. Think you More power your to money. you. I think that you got something that you love, and I am I applaud you for it, and I'm glad for you. And I don't think that you need to switch your speakers. I don't think you need to buy anything else. Agreed. I'm 100% okay with you having those bulk speakers. I feel like I controlled my anger pretty well on that one. All right, Infinite Gary. This is the world's shortest Infinite Gary question, at least 
physically. I have not read it yet. I don't know if you could tell by the way I'm stumbling over these questions. I haven't read these questions at all. This is my first read. So what actually creates a that oh my goodness, Gary. What actually creates that new product smell? Gary has noticed it with his new JVC projector. He finds it a bit unpleasant and strong at the moment, but his installer says it usually dissipates after about a hundred hours. Is that really what he said? What was written? Is it just is it just glues and sealants? Is there something actually burning off? Uh, okay. Everything you got to you take anything that you own, anything that you own. And put it in a box with some styrofoam packed around it and wrap it in plastic and then shove it in a warehouse for uh, a couple of months. Then take it out, pull it out of that bag, out of that box, out of that styrofoam, out of the bag, out of the whatever it's in. It's going to have a smell. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, there, there's probably some manufacturing smells that are giving off. And I think glues and sealants are probably part of that. But uh, I can't imagine that... Uh, I mean, they look, many people love that new car smell oh, yeah. or they love that new product smell because it, it, they associate it with getting something brand new and being excited with it. Um, no, I mean, anytime you get new clothes, new furniture, they, a new carpet, yeah. they all have that new product smell. And it's, I mean, every material has some kind of odor to it. You know, it's the foams, rubbers, and plastics. Your house and yeah. you have a fragrance to you. Sure. And something that has not been in your house doesn't have that fragrance fragrance yet. Once it gets into your house, it will. And that's why when you go to like your whatever, your mother-in-law, grandmother, or, you know, parents or something like that, they're like, oh, I've got this, this jacket. I don't need it anymore. Are you interested in it? Yeah, I love that jacket. Let me take it home. Whoa, I better wash this thing. <laughs> it's not dirty. Your parents aren't going to give you a jacket that they, they, they've been wearing for three weeks, you know, and, and sweating in the outside. They've washed it, but it smells like their house. Right? It smells like them. It doesn't smell like you yet. That's why you have to wash it. It's the same thing. Material smell. That's really all it is. Yeah. David on Twitter. David noticed a D-Motion Code logo on the back, back of a Blu-ray that he recently purchased. He's never seen that before. Well, who's that? How would you use a D-Box Motion Code at home? You have to be a D box kind of guy and buy yourself a D-Box chair. So uh, this is a chair that if you've ever been to one of the movies where the chair gallops as the, the horse gallops mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. swings around as you're going through the... I can only imagine what it does during Spider-Man Homecoming. Uh, I just finished watching that movie, which is a pretty good flick. And it was great that they had Michael Keaton in it because it's clear it's the whole circle of life where he goes from being a Batman to being the vulture. But uh, I like that movie. It's a very, very yeah. nice movie. But uh, that that's what, I mean, that's what it's for. It's, it's essentially, it's like saying ha- Atmos. Like if you have an Atmos receiver, you can get the Atmos soundtrack off of it. If you don't, then you don't. If you don't have a deep box chair hooked up to your, can, how many planes are going to go by tonight? I'm not closing that window. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you, that's what this is for. Yeah, uh, it, this might have just been uh, a little bit of uh, lack of awareness that you can have D box at home. It's they have a yeah. home solution. Uh, they sell a thing called the uh, H E M C controller. Uh, trying to figure out what a home entertainment motion controller. There, that's what that stands for. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I think that's a two or three thousand dollar thing, and then each seat typically costs a couple grand, like just for the D box motion actuators. If you want the three, they they offer a two axis and a three axis version. I can't imagine why you would get the two axis version because that is severely limiting the amount of movement that you can do. You definitely want the three axis version. And that's like a couple two grand. Two axis. Well, it's two axis, just front and back? Yeah. Two axis? No. Just, two, side to side? No, well, just like, front and back? Like this and like this. I can't see you. I'm not looking at you. So yeah. it's front and back, side to side, but then three axes is also up and down? Is that what I would oh, guess? three axes. Yeah, forward, back, left, right, up, down. Yeah. Okay. You're mi- missing one of those in the two axis version. So uh, it's can't, it, it can't be the side to side, right? It can't be just up, down, front, back. That would be so <laughs> weird. <laughs> That's what I mean. It, it makes no sense to have the two axis version. Anyway, it's it's not cheap, but you can certainly have it installed in your home theater. And then you have to purchase codes because D-Box creates the codes for each movie. They, they're right. the company that does that. So you have to purchase the code and not every movie is supported. They have a pretty big library, but not every movie is supported. But you purchase the code that synchronizes with your player and that's how it knows. So if you're seeing that a D-Box motion code is included, 
when you purchase the Blu-ray, that means they've got some promotion going on there. You don't have to separately purchase the code if you already own D-Box. I imagine you don't see it very often because not a lot of people have D-Box at home. But for whatever reason, they cut a promo with the studio. They're like, here, include this code. Maybe it'll get more people to buy D-Box at home. That's probably what I, it's about. Uh, I saw D-Box chairs in a theater um, store. Yeah. Like a higher end theater store. Yeah. It was a, it was an audio store. They mostly focused yeah, on like, the future. Yeah, uh, like Fortress one, Fortress one. seating does it. Continental seating does it. Yeah, and then and, and, I mean they're like and they're telling me all about it, and I'm they're like, you want to try that? I'm like, nope. <laughs> they're like, what? You want to try it? I'm like, my primary that reason awful. for buying D box movie theater tickets is so I have two armrests. That is my primary reason, not for the motion, yeah. just so I have two proper armrests and leg room and nobody kicking the back of my seat. Dave. Dave is pretty sure all his electrical outlets are properly grounded. The house is less than 10 years old. But he's noticed that his APC J35B has a ground screw. Should he ground it to something extra like copper pipe? No! Uh, no, that's not for grounding it, dude. That's for grounding other things. Jeez. That's what this what this is about. Yes, if you were to connect that ground screw to a copper pipe, that is how you create yourself some ground loops, sir. Yeah, that, that is, would, that that would be cause. bad. No, uh, directly from the manual they have, there is a system ground terminal that says the unit provides for the connection of grounding wires from all of your equipment to a central terminal lug. This ground connection eliminates ground loop problems. Tie all component grounds to this screw to break any possible ground loops that can cause an audible noise. Use a wire to connect any ungrounded components to this screw connecting to the TVSS screw will prevent sound or video interference from ungrounded equipment. So that's what it's there for. It's to ground other things. Next, he asks, could he connect the outputs on a cables to go IR repeater to the remote inputs on his equipment? So are you showing this picture? I am. Uh, okay. So basically cables to go makes a, uh, is like a box mm -hmm. and, uh, there's a couple of uh, like one receiver unit that you plug, like you put into your room and that hopefully has a real long cable and that you then plug into the back of this thing as an input. Mm -hmm. and, and that accepts the IR codes from your remote. Then it has these little repeater things that you plug into it, which will uh, you paste them to the front of each one of your uh, devices, like your receiver, your DVD player. Uh, you place it right over the IR input. And when you, how do you know what that is? Get a flashlight, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. fly, put it on the front of your device, and you will see it. You will see like this little light bulb looking thing, uh, little in, round like, the, spot. Yeah, a little corner, usually the, like a corner of the front panel someplace. Usually, yeah. It'll be kind of off to the side. Uh, and then you stick it right there, and that means that your IR codes will absolutely get where you want them to go. Uh, could you do this? Yes. Now, there's but also what? on the back of, say, an AV receiver, there's going to be a 3.5 millimeter plug input that says IR in and a, probably another one that says IR out. Right. Uh, and that will absolutely work with this as well. You would simply use a mono 3.5 millimeter cable right. to connect the output of one of this uh, cables to go repeaters, you'd, which is just a 3.5 millimeter mono plug. You'd plug that directly to another 3.5 millimeter mono plug into that IR in on, say, the back of your AV receiver. Uh, yeah, IR codes are like hex codes that are standardized for each brand and for each model. Right. And that's that's all that's being sent out is that signal. It's either being converted into IR light pulses or that very same code can go straight into that 3.5 millimeter IR in plug on the back of your AV receiver, say. So the real question, though, is why? Why? I mean... The, why would you do this? Mm -hmm. uh, you do this because you want your your you with your remote are in one room, and your gear is someplace else or behind a solid door. Yeah, it's out of sight. So when you 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 get this so that you can control your stuff still. So if you're not having problems controlling your stuff, then you don't need it. And many times you don't need all of what you're seeing right here anyways you don't need each one to go to each individual device that you that's up there i mean yes it will guarantee that it gets the the code that it's supposed to get but most of the time you just put one flasher in a in your in front of all your gear mm -hmm. and like just say you put your gear in the closet 
Okay, first of all, don't put your gear in the closet because it'll get very hot and then something will break. But if you're going to put it in the closet, then get some ventilation or whatever. You put your gear in the closet, then you, you're going to close the closet door, and then you're going to have your IR receiver that's going to come like snake out the top of the door and maybe, you know, just kind of hang out on the door frame or something like that, where it's at the front of your room, we'll, we'll say. And you, when you press the remote, people naturally point in that to TV, plus the remotes, if you could see the IR blast coming out of it, it would it's like a spotlight. I mean, it's, it's huge. It's just flashing it everywhere. So it would hit that. It would go into your device. You could put one IR flasher like stuck to like the door, like the, to the so that when you close the door, it would be facing all of your gear. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, that's going to work as long as you have a reasonable amount of line of sight. If, if you don't, paint the door white and just have it reflect everything yep. around in there and uh, you would be good. But yeah, this will work. This will absolutely work. Yep. Ryan. So Ryan says, after using his Vizio M series for a couple of weeks now, he's really enjoying it, but he's curious. Does the backlight setting have any bearing on peak brightness for HDR brightness? Should he crank up the backlight to get the most out of HDR movies slash games, or can he just leave it lower where he would for SDR content? Or you might have different settings, and I don't know the answer to this question, obviously, because I don't do the HDR stuff. But you might have different settings for this, but the answer to the question, should I just, is always no. <laughs> <laughs> the answer to any question that starts with, should I just, they, no, you should not do whatever the thing is you're thinking of doing because it's clearly wrong and that's why you've asked it in such a way. But, uh, or at least you think it's wrong and that's why you asked it in such a way. But uh, yeah, we're, ne we're never just going to crank up the backlight in order to get more brightness because you're also washing out your blacks you're killing your contrast by doing that so there is a optimal level of backlighting that you want and it may be different for sdr versus hdr and rob will tell you in a second if that's true <laughs> so um yeah on a lot of hdr tvs they don't even give you the option that ends up getting grayed out as soon as it goes into hdr mode on a lot of hdr tvs it will just peg the backlight as bright as it can possibly go and they gray it out and they don't give you any choice uh and yeah, most dolby vision tvs the backlight gets set right in the middle and gets grayed out and it isn't actually in the middle it's just dolby doesn't want you touching it because they strictly control how much light comes out of the display under dolby vision uh vizio does allow you to alter the backlight setting in hdr mode and you can just sort of think of it as like a universal i am shifting everything to be brighter including my blacks or i'm shifting everything to be dimmer including my hdr highlights it is kind of just moving the entire scale up and down now they do have full array local dimming but we're talking 32 64 zones or something yeah. like that that is really not certainly not pixel precise not even remotely close to pixel precise so overall is just kind of raising or lowering the entire brightness level which is kind of nice because if you're in a pitch black room sometimes you want the absolute blackest black you can have and then you don't want the highlight to be searingly bright whereas if you have a little bit of ambient light you don't mind raising the black level a little bit because you need to anyway just to make the shadows visible so it's kind of nice that they let you do it uh but it isn't just that you peg it you kind of want to respond to how much light you have in your room and the simple answer is wherever the backlight looks correct for sdr is where it should be for hdr because yeah. when you're setting sdr you've now set your black level and your white level to be correct so that you see all the detail in the sdr image and that doesn't change for hdr you still want black to be at that level and then whites get brighter but you still want your black to be where it is. You don't want to shift the black point just because you're suddenly watching HDR. That didn't change. So wherever it is for SDR, leave it there for HDR. That's the answer. So he's also curious about the difference between lossy music versus lossy movie tracks. On many occasions, we've said we don't mind listening to music at 320 kilobits per second or even less for uh, MP3s and AACs and all that. But we insist on listening to lossless tracks for a movie. Why is one more important or obviously different than the other? Uh, for the record, he does the same thing, listening to compressed <laughs> music but lossless movies. It seems that Dolby Digital sound, that s that track sounds flat and choked compared to a lossless track, but compressed music sounds pretty great compared to a, a, the lossless flack, and he just doesn't know why. Well, okay, first of all, they really don't give you anything, uh, any other options these days, right? It used right. to be, it, it used to be you could choose like the the, the DTSMA or the Dolby Dolby True HD, or you could choose the five point one. 
that, that's, that's, those, those days are gone. <laughs> those don't, days don't exist anymore. So, but given the choice, would I choose one over the other? Well, if you, it's very hard to make a very fair comparison here between the lossy one versus the lossless one. Because to, in my mind, unless I know for sure that the lossy one is derived from the lossless one, mm. I assume that they're different, like, entirely like they were made at different times different people stepped into the studio at different times to mix these tracks therefore you're not comparing apples and apples you're comparing two different complete tracks but what he says is that uh the dolby digital track sounds flat and choke compared to a lossless track uh i i would not disagree with your your description i often think it sounds uh truncated mm-hmm uh, I feel like there's less highs. There's definitely left less lows. Like there's the difference in the bass seems to me to be pretty significant. And it not I wouldn't necessarily say it flat, but uh, there isn't the. Well, I guess I would say flat because I was about to say something about the depth of it. It just doesn't seem like there's as much there in the rest of the track. You know, the rest of the rest of the the, the frequencies, but the highs and the lows definitely seem to be truncated. And I guess I would agree with you that the rest of it sounds pretty flat. Uh, I'm sure there's a reason why. the The reality is, though, that we don't have the choice anymore. I'm happy for that. But when there was the choice and you chose between the two, there was a real audible difference. Though I won't say that living with the 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 Dolby Digitals that we had before and, and definitely the DTS uh, tracks that we had on the the the, the Superbit d- discs I still find quite acceptable, mm-hmm. but the lossless tracks when you compared them on the same disc, which I'm again saying I still don't think it's an apple to apples comparison. There was enough of a difference where you're like, yeah, this one's clearly better. Yeah, so it's not just as cut and dry as lossless versus lossy because it's how lossy is it. Uh, That's true. When we well. had HD DVD, and a lot of those had Dolby Digital Plus, but it was the high bitrate version of Dolby Digital Plus, where you had 1.5 or or more uh, megabits per second uh, dedicated to the Dolby Digital Plus audio, that lossy audio sounded every bit as good as the lossless audio, which is similar to having a high bitrate MP3, a 256 or a 320 kilobit per second MP3 versus the lossless, uh, you know, FLAC or, or just WAV file or whatever it is. So when you go back to typical 5.1 Dolby Digital, that is encoded at 384 kilobits per second. That's the rate that's typically used. That's 5.1, that's six channels, that's 64 kilobits per second per channel. So think about a 64 kilobit per second MP3 versus lossless or a 256 or a 320. You can hear the difference in a 64 kilobit per second MP3. And that's essentially what your typical Dolby Digital 5.1 on any DVD, that was the bit rate. Um, I think we mix higher than that for this podcast <laughs> per right, channel. Right, yeah. Because I, mean, I think we're mono. So <laughs> that's right. I, 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 I think it's like 96 or something, but it might even be lower so than I mean, that. But it's higher than 64. Vanilla Dolby Digital 5.1 maxed out at 640 kilobits per second. Uh, and that gives you about 106 kilobits per second per channel. And that was sometimes used on, uh, on Blu-rays, you know, when you listen to the Dolby Digital version. And... It's kind of not, it's, it's, it's a little, you can hear the improvement over the DVD version that was at 64 kilobits per second per channel, because that's really low. That's really low. So it's how lossy is it? And there definitely can be a difference depending on what bit rate was used. Now, DTS was 1.5 megabits per second. Their compression wasn't as good. It wasn't as efficient as Dolby Digital's. So they needed more bandwidth, but it had significantly more bandwidth, so they could... They don't have to truncate as many. I mean, that's what compression is doing. It is clipping off highs and lows that you supposedly aren't going to miss. But when you really start crunching it down to 64 kilobits per second, you start losing audible audible stuff. So, uh, yeah, that's what's going on there. Mark. So Mark applied our ideas on his issue with poor sound uh, sounding audio using Dolby Digital Plus from Netflix. He went back to exclusively using his PS3 and changed the audio output to Bitstream. He now has Dolby Digital Plus on the front display of his AVR. Mm-hmm. While this now confirms the audio format being used for the content he's watch, 
or at least he's watching, he's still experiencing the overall lack of bass and immersive audio. Strangely, similar to the all channels uh, stereo, uh, similarly, switching to all channel stereo makes Dolby Digital Plus as well as stereo two channel content sound much better. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like <laughs> it seems like the solution may be coming down to the side if it's worth a, uh, to purchase a physical copy on Blu-ray or just deal with what his wife calls. You're the only one that can hear the difference in. <laughs> uh, yeah, so he's wait, he's using all channel stereo. Well, I mean that's so, one way to make all your speakers make noise. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I don't make. I mean, it sounds like. I mean, this it sounds like what he's wanting is louder. To be honest with you, mm. and, and 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 stuff that's coming from all the way around because all channel stereo, your front panel, your front speakers, and your back speakers are playing the exact same thing. Yeah, you know, your front lefts are playing the same as your back. Your your rear lefts and your front rights are playing the same as your you know front rights or whatever yeah so th if that's better to you then you should do that and stop <laughs> bugging your wife yeah. but hey rob if it sounds better to him, it's okay. I know. I was okay? just, it's I, it's I'm, wrong. I don't want to. But always it's okay. The, <laughs> I don't want to always give the advice of well, anything you think initially sounds better is is the way to go. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, this well, could I, be. A, I, I, He's not going to get any. I mean, I, I don't know where the extra bass is coming yeah. from because it seems like he doesn't like the bass, and you're not going to get any more bass unless you just goose your what? subwoofer output. For well, I'm saying that. that. I'm, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking from just changing that setting, he's saying he, it sounds better to him. So I'm wondering if he's thinking he's getting more bass. If you get more bass, maybe it's because now all you know, both the channels are all getting the same stuff. Yeah. Which means he's getting more of it cut off and sent to the subwoofer. That's right. But the, you know, maybe he's getting a little goose in the bass that way. So maybe what you need to do is leave it in double, Dolby Digital Player, Bitstream out, mm -hmm. bump up your subwoofer 3 dB. Mm-hmm. And uh, put your to go to your receiver settings and set uh, lo settings lock, and then put your remote away. And stop messing with it, dude. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this could be a little bit actually of what we were just referring to in the last one because when you're getting from Netflix, Dolby Digital Plus, what they're doing in that instance is the opposite end of what Dolby Digital Plus can do, which is an even lower bit rate than yeah. vanilla Dolby Digital with supposedly the same quality as vanilla Dolby Digital. They're not using the HD DVD end of Dolby Digital Plus, which was to increase the bit rate where they're doing the polar opposite. There, it's even less, even lower bit rate. There's even less information there. So there, there really might be just some frequencies being truncated in that soundtrack. That could be the case. If you're comparing yeah, yeah. the oh, Netflix... Yeah, yeah. Not just could, is. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, if you're I mean, comparing the Netflix stream to the Ultra HD Blu-ray in full lossless Atmos, yeah, there's no question. The full right. lossless Atmos sounds better. I'm not going to... Yeah. There's no debate about that in my mind. I, I was saying... What he was describing before sounded much more egregious than this. It wasn't just that, oh, the Blu-rays with the full lossless audio sound better. He was like, there's like no bass. There's nothing. And I'm like, that's yeah. not what I'm getting from Netflix. I'm still getting my subwoofers playing. They're not sitting there silent. But compared oh, yeah. to what I... If I watch a movie through my Netflix streaming versus... The Ultra HD Blu-ray or just the regular Blu-ray disc with losses. Yeah. yeah, there's no question the audio is better on the disc. So that oh. kind of just is what it is. What it is, yeah. right. So all this audio trouble brings up another question. Is the audio for TV and movies always mastered with the same amount of care and to the same standard? For example, when he want, really wants to show off his theater, he throws Tron Legacy into the Blu-ray player and skips immediately to the light cycle battle. Th that sequence of the entire movie really seems to be using DTS uh, HDMA to its full potential, while some other movies, not so much. Are these titles that, despite having DTS HD or true HD format, are they not getting the right amount of attention during sound mastering? <laughs> well, okay, there, you got two different things going on here. Okay, first of all, the stuff that's coming over your TV is being compressed mm -hmm. to get to, to get there to to stream to get to you. It has to fit through the the tubes uh, of whatever that tube may be. It might be the internet. It may be your cable provider. It's got to get to you some way, and it can't use too much bandwidth. Uh, and when that happens, you lose stuff mm -hmm. so though we've already said those are different those are audibly different between the two it's there's no contest if you've ever like it, right now go watch dr strange on uh netflix and then get the blu-ray 
or the DVD even <laughs> and throw it in there and you're going to be like, wow, that sounds so much better. Yes, it sounds so much better. You're right. That's an audible difference. You're absolutely 100% correct. There's no doubt about it. We're all on the same page. But I don't believe that the master that, that this is a mastering issue. I don't think that that's what's going on. I don't think that you're getting a completely different master for the Netflix version. You may be. You may be, but I, I don't think that's what I think they're taking whatever the studios have, they're compressing it down to a size that they can manage, and then that's that's what you're getting. Now, title to title differences mm. is a completely different thing. Yes. I mean, you can even see within the same title different versions. You know, as they get remastered, and I mean the super, the super bit. I can't believe I'm bringing up super bit twice in one episode, but super bit, you know, were like these remastered versions of movies that had a special care taken with their audio and their video to get you the best possible quality of both. It's the same movie. It's the same soundtrack. Does it sound different? Probably. I don't know. I have never done the A B comparison because if I buy one, I'm certainly not buying the other. So there's no, you know. There's going to be some differences there. But f between movies, yeah, the difference in audio is going to be 100% related to, well, first of all, what's the content in the movie? Because uh, believe me, Pacific Rim and some of the Transformers movies, you know, their whole point was to try to destroy subwoofers <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And I, God love them for it. But uh, other movies aren't going to be that way. They're not going to have that kind of content in there, number one. But number two, yeah, you get... One person who's doing the mastering in there and they are, they care about certain parts of the audio track maybe more than others. You know, they're, they're listening to something that you're not listening to or they're mastering for a home theater setup or a TV setup that isn't what you have. You know, they're thinking, hey, this is going to be played in a normal TV, you know, just off the TV speakers. I will, I, I will listen to it with all this stuff, but I'm having in mind how does it sound on this soundbar? Yeah, from from TV show to TV show, from movie to movie, there can definitely be huge differences. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's budgets to be concerned with. There's the number of staff on hand to be concerned with. There's the time constraints. Sure, you know, a TV show has to be made in eight days versus a movie that might go for hundreds of days sometimes in the really high budget stuff. So there's there can be tremendous differences. But if you're actually talking about just the standard of is there some standard that everybody targets? We talk about reference volume and that. That standard exists, but it isn't always adhered to. There are lots of movies that are mixed for the home release where they go, nobody listens at 85 dB, we're going to settle on 75. That's a lot. A lot of them say the average is actually going to be 75 with 95 dB peaks. That's what's on the disc or that's what's coming over the stream. And yeah, it sounds quieter than the movies where they said, no, we're going to go full reference volume, 85 dB average, 105 decibel peaks. Some are just plain louder than others. And that's the that's what is on the disc or that's what's coming over your cable or that's what's coming over the internet and there's nothing you the user can do about that this one's just mixed louder than the other one um there are you know some are thx certified and they're meant to be listened to with thx re-eq which means if you don't have thx re-eq -E -E they probably sound too bright they probably sound yeah. too shrill because yeah. THX re EQ knocks down the treble. Um, so, yeah, th there can be different things done, certainly from movie to movie, from TV show to TV show. It, it can vary a lot. Even though we have this reference volume standard, it, it isn't adhered to all over the place. Henry. Henry has an old Creative Inspire 7.1 P780, 7800, 7800. Sorry, computer speaker system in his computer room, and it's time for an upgrade. The room is 10, uh, 13 feet by 10 feet. That's pretty standard. And there is a queen size bed in there. All right, so it's a bedroom. Mm. He's considering a few things. Okay, so it's a 7.1 setup current. That's what he's got right now. Yeah. He's considering the Logitech uh, Z906 5.1 system with Bluetooth adapter. Uh, it looks good to him, but they just dropped the price, which suggests that new models may be coming out soon. Should you wait for that? The price seems about 300 bucks right now. He's looking at the Klipsch R15PM and the R8SW 2.1 system. Not surround sound, but is it better than the Logitech system in other ways? And uh, that's... And I guess the last one is he, he's asking, do we think Atmos enabled computer speakers are likely to exist soon? Is that something he should wait for? Well, okay. 
there are just so many ways to answer this question yeah. that are running through my head right now. And the first thing that comes to my mind, oh, first of all, he wants to spend about 300 bucks. All right. I mean, it looks as gonna, though I'm, I'm assuming that. that that Klipsch combo is upwards of 400. So I'm thinking between and, and that Logitech system is normally around $400. Like you said, okay. the price just dropped. So I think he's in the three to four hundred dollar range. I would I would say is a safe bet. All right. First of all, I don't think you're gonna be happy with the two point one system. I just I just don't uh, right now think that that's the case. Uh, if you've been going from a seven point one, which maybe he's only been using five point one this whole time, Could be. but if you're going from a seven point one, then I'm not sure you're gonna be super happy with uh, uh, a two point one mm. system. Maybe you will be. And that's fine. Uh, will the Klipsch be significantly better than the Logitechs? Probably better, I would imagine. Uh, there's going to be some more attention to detail paid to the audio uh, and the performance and the linearity and stuff. But, you know, Klipsch is also known for just being super loud. I mean, that's part <laughs> of what, they're, they're, they, what they do. And you're going to be sitting awfully close. So how loud do they have to be? Uh this is something that you could probably test in the store a little bit. You could at least get a sense of how they sound in the store, I would imagine. Uh, I'm okay with the Logitech. Uh, I don't think that you should wait for the new models to come out because what yeah. exactly are they going to bring out that's going to be so revolutionary that you are like, oh, I can't believe I wasted my money on this one. It's not. It's not going to be revolutionary. It's going to be one little thing. That's going to be it. But you're kind of limiting yourself with your suggestions here uh, as to what you could be getting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you could get a sound bar. Yeah. You know, an, an Atmos enabled sound bar. <laughs> now you're going to be sitting awfully close to it. I don't, I mean, unless you're thinking about doing this on your bed, like you're yeah. sitting on the bed, that's the only way Atmos is going to work. I don't want to do ceiling uh, bounce for a desktop setup. That. That I don't either. Work. <laughs> that's not going to work. And that's why I don't think Atmos enabled computer speakers are ever going to be a thing. Mm. Not really. I could see them doing it. I just, I don't think don't it's going to be a be great a good experience. Idea. Maybe, maybe, oh, maybe they do it, but they, they like have like a little hanger thing that comes out the, the, like a post thing that comes out the back with a little piece of wood for you to bounce it off of and you can like extend it so that it's at the right angle for you. I mean, I, I can, I can see them eventually throwing it in there, but, uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm dubious about how well that's going to work because it's it's going to be the upward firing thing. That's that is going to be what it is if they ever do it. And from right. a desktop, from a near field setup, I just I don't know how that would work. I really feel like for if you're going to go 2.1, that you could go with a you know uh, a small receiver or integrated amp and 2.1. get your. Yeah, two point, or even five point one. Really, I mean, I mean, for for two point one, I would just point at audio engine. Well, and they've got a sub. I've got audio engine. You know, I'm yeah. I'm I'm thinking that we could go bigger than this. Audio engine. Mm -hmm. Well, audio engine actually has some pretty big speakers. They do. Too. No, I mean, if if you want to downsize the whole configuration all the way down to two point one, I'm just going to point at audio engine. That's what I would get for my computer speakers if I wanted a two point one setup. You know, I, I, I've never been that impressed with the creative or the Logitech or any PC speakers for that matter. Well, it's the subwoofer is, or the woofer is the problem. They're always so small. Well, and the so satellites small are so that small can't... that there's a gap between the sub and the satellites. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I've just, I've never been impressed with PC speakers. So I'm of two minds. I've got two ways of coming at this. Either I go 2.1 and I go audio engine and I don't worry about anything else because those are great and they're affordable and that's what I want for 2.1. Or... Since you asked about Atmos, I'm going to get an inexpensive Atmos setup. I'm going to start with Mono Price's uh, 5.1 speaker package, which is $140 right now, I think. And they're, a, they're, I mean, they got sued by Energy because they're so similar to the Tate Classics. Oh, right, right. And right, actually, right, right, they like right. changed like one component in the crossover and they're selling them again. So yeah, $140. It's their Mono Price Premium 5.1 home theater subwoofer satellite system that's 5.1 now you can get another pair of the exact matching monoprice premium satellite speakers for another 50 dollars for the pair so that would give you seven speakers plus their subwoofer which is actually not a bad subwoofer especially at that price and then i'd hop over to accessories for less and right now i'd grab myself a denon x1300w 
which is going for $250. That gets you Malt-EQ XT. I guarantee you no PC speakers have anything even remotely close to that. So for the grand total of, what did we get ourselves to? Just over $400, $430 or so? You have a full 5.1.2 Atmos setup with some darn reasonable satellite speakers for mono price and a full-fledged AV receiver. That's that's my solution to you. I'd either do that or I'd get audio engines. I get behind that. <laughs> uh, if you if you want to see this was what I was thinking I was thinking audio engine I've already got so and I've recommended the bunch I was trying to, to rack my brains to go with something else. So the two things that three things that came to my mind were uh, NHT Super Zeros. Oh yeah, that could with work. a with a receiver. The and price a, and is a, a little bit higher on those though. That is true, yeah. but I think. It may be worth it because he still wants. He may still want really small, mm. and the, the energy take ones are they're not energy takes. The model price ones are small, mm -hmm. right? They're like that big. They're not that big, right? How big are they? Do you know how big they are? Yeah, well, they, it's like a three and a half inch drive in there, so it's a. So it's, it's got to be that. like a five inch, yeah, five inch, six inch cabinet. So it's gonna be a bit bigger than the NHT Super Zeros, uh, and you could start building it. You go with two point one, get yourself a you know a small SVS sub or something like that. But you can't really do that. No, that's all. Not the SVS. What's the what's the cheapest sub that we recommend these days? What is it? What is it? Ugh, like RSLs. Yeah, I guess but, RSLs. I mean, it, this is way over the budget. This is more than double the. Budget. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. I mean, if they I had that kind of I'm budget, suggesting. then fine. But yeah, that's. Uh, I also would be looking at uh, the KRK speakers. And their little subwoofer because mm. they're studio monitors, self-powered, uh, very easy uh, setup and everything else. And they play. I mean, you could really, you could really pump those things. There's the KRK uh, rockets, right? The rockets, yeah. It's a uh, it's it, but anyways, uh, the the rockets are a pretty good little system. And you can go with the two two point oh, and then add a point one later if you wanted to. But I think. And I don't know what you're using this for because you haven't told us. But I think if you're going to spend 400 bucks, you could spend $400 on a fantastic set of headphones that would blow mm. any of the rest of the stuff away. Yeah, you get those Hi-Fi Mans, HE400s. I, I I think that for that this amount of money that you're looking for, you could have... Now, the thing you're going to be lacking is that tactile base. That is true. But... I really feel like for five hundred, four or five hundred dollars, you could get the like the high fi man. So is the one that Rob recommends. But there's tons of great headphones out there for around this price point. That's really unless you are sharing this audio with other people, you don't have to just wear headphones because you're trying to, to not bother neighbors. Sometimes you bought you wear them because they can give you much better sound for much less money as long as you don't have to share. So that's where I'm going. Okay. Chris. Uh, first off, Chris is listening to AV Rant in chronological order, and he's back at episode 504. We're like at 560-something, aren't we? Okay, so anyways. So he apologizes if we've already answered some or all of his questions. Well, we I apologize. Mind. It's going it's to take you 750 hours to get up to, <laughs> to where you are to hear your question answered. Very, I'm very sorry important about we that. let everyone know we do not mind if you ask the same question. You, you can come back every week and ask the same question. We'll still answer it. We, we yeah. do not mind. Yeah. No, we don't mind. So anyways, Chris is helping a friend install a home theater in her basement, and he will be doing all the labor. She was impressed by his setup, which includes a BenQ HT2050 and a Klipsch floor standing and all-wall speakers. And uh, once he told her how affordable all the gear is these days, she decided that she's willing to spend upwards of five to $6,000 to have a theater in her basement. Chris, marry this woman. <laughs> marry her now. Do not let her get away. Do not let her. I don't care if you're already married. Marry this one too. Uh, the area she'd like to use is, is finished, but it has an awkward shape and dimensions. Overall, it's roughly 22 feet long, 13 and a half feet wide, and 7 feet 8 inches tall. But there's a support pole, a soffit for HVAC, an angled wall, and a hallway. In total, it's, it's about 2,800 cubic feet. And while the rest of the basement has a uh, bathroom and its unfinished portion, there are doors separating this finished room from all of that, so it's an enclosed space. That's good. 2,800 is not that bad. She does not want to do any major construction, but drywall cuts and repairs to run wires and install speakers are okay. She has said she doesn't want to 
pull the L-shaped couch away from the rear wall or add an additional row of seats, but we will dig into the layer layout of the theater in a bit. Okay, so here we go, We're looking at it here. There's a couch, okay, and the love seat, and then... Yeah, it's a very that is, oddly that shaped weird, room. That is a very oddly shaped and, room. And yes, uh, yeah, like so, so okay, so let's, I'll, I'll just describe that. So she's got a TV in a corner, and to the right of the TV, there's like an alcove. Um, right. that you cannot is that, see. Uh, is that a it's a full wall all the way up to the it's not a half no, wall. No, that's there, a full right? wall going in there. So there's full a wall. there's an alcove. So it's like almost like a closet without a door on it, yeah. right to to the right of this thing. To the right basically. to the right of her TV. Her TV is sort of in a front left corner. And then straight back from that, she's got an L shaped couch. And then to the yeah. right of the L shaped couch, she's got a love seat, which can see the TV when it's in the corner, but it's going to have a bit of difficulty because there's like an angled wall beside the love seat. So viewing conditions are quite limited. You're, you're, if you use the larger portion of this room to house all of your seating, you can essentially only see the front left corner, which is exactly where she's put her television right now. So let's, uh, with that, we can go into question A. Okay. I'm just kind of trying to wrap my head around this. No. Oh, here, and there's actual pictures. Oh, oh. Yes. <laughs> wow. Is that a microwave on the TV, on a, on a little refrigerator back there? That's interesting. I like our couches. Uh, okay, it's an interesting little space, I have to say. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting little space. It's an unfortunate space, but it's an interesting space. Okay, so how should we lay out this room in her mind she basically just wants to keep it exactly as is and simply have a projection screen instead of a flat panel tv but with this irregularly shaped room what's the best way to position and orient everything as a theater okay um five to six thousand dollars how much do those drop screen uh seymour av acoustically transparent screens cost oh they're up over two grand yeah that's that's not happening. Well, it's not necessarily not happening. Yeah. We just have to skimp on everything else. It's going to be. Uh, I'm 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 looking at this room. And I'm trying to figure out how we can lay it. Now, if we put a projection screen that drop down, uh, right where that alcove that little alcove wall mm. is, and then we put her her speakers like literally all behind there, all behind there, like in walls, even. I guess it really wouldn't matter, and then. We did 5.2, of course, point four. four still want four overheads. If you're going to do, we could if you're do, do Atmos, you want four overheads. But we could just have that screen drop down right there where that alcove is. The problem is you could no longer get to the alcove when you're watching TV. <laughs> yeah. You'd have to go underneath the screen to make that <laughs> or happen. Or raise the screen. I mean, or raise the screen. My, my recommendation is to do all the things she said she didn't want to do. But it's, it's honestly what I would do in this room, which is where her couch is right now, the back of her couch, that, that wall back there behind her couch, that's where I'm going to put the screen. I'm going to completely flip this around 180 degrees. But I'm actually going to... She'll never fit her couches to the other side. Well, I'm going to have her L-shaped couch uh, kind of like... So you, if you came into the entrance... Right there mm -hmm. would be the side of the L-shaped couch. One side would be along the side wall, and then the L-shaped couch would be like out in the middle of the room, facing the big wall where the screen is. And then I would have her love seat behind that, essentially where her TV is now. So the love seat would be beside the alcove as your second row of overflow seating. She says she didn't want two rows. She says she didn't want to move her couch. I'm saying that's what exactly what I would do is create two rows by having the, the love seat back where her TV is presently. I'd flip the whole room around 180 degrees so that the large wall is where the screen could go and the couch would be out in the middle of the room. Sorry, but that's she's what I would do. Go I know she's never going to go I, I just, for that. I don't, I don't she's know never going to go do, for though. that. Well, okay. You've got the alcove. You could use that for uh, gear. Oh, yes, and yes. Gear else, can go in right? the alcove. We'll all agree on that. Uh. I think you do a spend a, a lot of money on a screen that's acoustically transparent and drop. You drop it right there, yeah. having it go as close as you can to that alcove. You want that entire thing. Have it drop down in front of. Yeah. You could use... Yeah, I'm heck, not against that. I'm not against uh, that. Then in-wall speakers for and in-ceiling speakers for everything else. Uh, yeah. 
I, I mean, you don't technically have to use in-wall speakers, but the, the benefit, this is a selling point. The selling point is you're not going to have to, you're never going to, you're going to walk in and it's just going to be an open room. You're not going to see any speakers. Right. You're not going to see any TV. You're not going to see any screen. You're going to press a button. And a screen on your comes down. Remote. Yeah. The screen comes down. The lights dim because you're going to put the lights on the dimmer, mm -hmm. right? And the, the lights dim and boom, you've got sound. Yeah, if the, if got, the seats really cannot move, then I agree with that, that... Uh... That you're going to spend what might seem like an inordinate amount on the screen, but that's the way to make this happen. I agree. You're going to put a that. subwoofer in the front left corner. That's the only, and a subwoofer between the love seat and the couch in the back, back right corner. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Hell, if if the seats what, really dude? can't move, I'm, I agree with that. You could actually have this screen. Shut up, Tom. I'm a, I'm a genius. You could have this screen go in front of that alcove wall. Have it do the entire wall. Right, yeah. you put one speaker on the alcove wall. That's your front right speaker. It's gonna have. It's gonna be closer, but who cares, right? <laughs> who cares? You're gonna put right on that corner as close as you can to that corner. You can put one way to the, you know, way to the left. Well, maybe not that far to the left. You have to put put pretty far to the left. And the center speaker, you know, in the center of the screen. Straight ahead. Then straight ahead. Then you've got a humongous screen. Yeah. That you can no longer get to that alcove during this time, <laughs> but you make sure you don't put anything back there that you want to get during TV watching things. Yeah. yeah, I agree. If if the seats really can't move, then you want a, a screen that comes down in front of that alcove. So everything is going to be based on you being able to sell this screen and uh, what the screen is going to cost, because the screen cost is going to one hundred percent determine how much you have to spend on everything. Yeah, else. I mean, you don't have you to only... go see more AV. You can go acoustically transparent from Elite Screens to bring the price down by about a thousand dollars. Yeah, and then, you know what? She's not going to know the difference. So no. you can go ahead and get the cheaper screen. I think yeah. that will save you a grand. You know, you're talking two subwoofers, twenty eight hundred square feet. You you basically have a base trap in that in that <laughs> walkway. You know, you've actually got two base traps if you count the alcove. So, you know, the, the alcove is not as good, but the hallway is going to, some of that base is going to go out there. So you don't know how this is going to sound really for, true, but, uh, you know, we can put up some uh, some acoustic, a couple of acoustic treatments in here. You get some in-wall in, in speakers and in-ceiling speakers at a fairly reasonable price. Uh, I think you can probably get away with spending... I mean, what do you think for subwoofers? Uh, twenty eight hundred cubic feet. We could do. I mean, if you can hop on the sale right now, I'd get. I'd get because I. I know she's not going to want the gigantic PD twelve no, NSDs. No, no. But two yeah. of the SB twelve NSDs at four hundred dollars each right now, for the size output capability, you you can't beat that. Two SB twelve so NSDs for four hundred dollars each. You're I mean, gonna be eight hundred dollars in for subs, yeah. right? You can probably spend a maybe a thousand dollars on uh speakers i think uh Could probably so let's say a hundred dollars a pair yeah at times five pairs sure that'll work yeah it's a thousand dollars on speakers uh we'll say a thousand dollars on subs and then you got cabling receiver mm -hmm. and uh projector and some acoustic treatments that's five grand Oh yeah, you probably no, this do. can be done. I, I can, yeah. you, and we've actually covered minutes. a lot of the other questions, so we'll run through them. <laughs> oh, I guess I'll have to run through them. This is what happens when I read the questions beforehand. Yeah, well, we're, so, we're not uh, even going to get close to coming to the end of this podcast. It would have it would have been nice if you had some idea of how long these questions were. I <laughs> uh, would. So, uh, he's been, did I already read the first one? Uh, yeah. Regular shape. Yeah. Okay. He's a bit concerned about the low soffit that houses the HVAC, particularly when it comes to installing a ceiling mounted projector. Should he consider a short throw model? Uh, no, because it's going to be too expensive. You can't. Well, uh, no, you can, because he's saying, is there something equivalent to the HT2050? And yes, there is. Is the HT2150 ST, which stands for short throw, and uh, that's under a thousand dollars. In fact, I think I saw it on Amazon for eight hundred dollars. All right. So that is uh, that is entirely doable. That that's more expensive than the HT2050, but not ridiculously so. Certainly doesn't put it completely out of reach. So yeah, if if you require like uh, you can throw the uh, hundred inch size screen from five feet away with the twenty one fifty. So if if necessary, that is an option. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, that's all. Uh, you still have our budget. Still has you. If you spend a thousand dollars on the on the projector, you'll be okay. Uh, he's definitely wants battery backup and power protection for the projector and the rest of the gear. And what battery backup do we recommend? The J series from a APC. Yep. We've said that multiple times. Yeah. So a J J twenty five B is the one I'd point you to because it's less expensive than the J thirty five. You don't need the voltage regulation. You can get away with that. You don't need the super long battery life. You know, you just want something that'll let you shut everything down properly and let your DVR keep recording. So I'd I'd point you to a J25B. Right. That's the high value model in there. So he's found a fairly inexpensive male power inlet that uses standard 14.2 Romex and fits in a standard single gang electrical box. Will that work for getting the battery protected power up to the ceiling mounted projector? And the answer is yes. Yes. It yeah. Shall. So you will put this yeah, male good. outlet side. Uh, yeah. That'll go beside your APC. So it'll just be a regular power cord that goes from this male outlet side into the APC. Then you run Romex from this male outlet to a standard outlet that you install near the projector. And then the right. standard, you just plug the projector into the standard outlet and you've essentially created an in-wall extension cord is really what you've done. So yeah, that's totally fine. So she's interested in Atmos. What should the configuration be? 5.2.4. We already said that. Yeah, if, uh, if the seats aren't moving, then 5.2.4. Yeah. If you rearrange the room 180 degrees with two rows, like I suggested, you could expand to 7.2.4. That would be dual. I have but... a feeling that if, if we really looked at this, you couldn't because of that way that alcove yeah. is. No, 5.2.4 5. To do... will be totally satisfactory in here. Yeah. Yeah. She wants a very clean look as far as all the speakers go. She's thinking in-walls, but would in-walls uh, or traditional floor standing or bookshelf speakers sound significantly better? Uh, depends on how much she's spending on the in-walls <laughs> and how much she's spending on the everything else. There's great in-walls, there's great on-walls, and there's great uh, bookshelves and floor standing speakers. And there's also garbage models of every single one of those things I just <laughs> said. So what you're going to do is realize that she's not going to care that much about the sound. She wants it to sound good, and you can do that. You can do that for the amount of money that we are. We're, mm -hmm. Figure out everything else, okay? We already told you what subwoofers to get. You should be buying them right now. The rest of it, you know, you're going to have to kind of budget it all in and kind of figure out and make sure that she's on board for all of that. Uh, but there is no hard and fast, hey, this is a floor standing speaker. Therefore, it is categorically better than every in-wall speaker. It just doesn't work that way. So if they go with in walls, how do you address the toe in and aiming? I don't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they don't get towed in and they don't get aimed. They are designed to be that way. And you're just going to live with how you place them. Place them in the proper locations mm -hmm. and hope. That's how it is. No, I mean, work. some of them do have the swivelable tweeters. I don't really recommend doing just the tweeter because you the off-axis response of the tweeter and the woofer should be similar. So if you swivel only the tweeter and not the woofer, you just threw all of that off. So I'm not a big fan of swiveling tweeters, but a lot of in-wall and in-ceiling speakers do give you a plus or minus treble boost or cut, and that can help. Right. Because yeah. if what you're discovering is everything sounds fine except the treble is a little bit too low, then you just click the little boost button and that solves that. So I, I yeah. would definitely use the boost or cut uh, buttons as necessary, but that's about it. Uh, would mono price in wall and in ceiling speakers be a good choice? Do we have any recommendations for something much better that doesn't cost a lot more? Those are like the super cheap. Those ones, are the right? super cheap ones. That's uh, under fifty dollars yeah. a pair. Which yeah. Okay, They're fine. but I yes. would point you to Outdoor Speaker Depot. For the overheads or for everything? For everything. The, the MK series, so there's the MK650s are the overheads, and the MKW650s are the in-walls. Mm -hmm. They definitely have a nicer tweeter than any uh, than those monoprice speakers. Now, they're about double the price. You're looking at about $100 a pair, but yeah, that's, well, that's pretty doable. reasonable. Yeah. That's pretty high. I am pair, going to... Reasonable. Yeah, I'm going to recommend that you uh, price everything else out mm. and then see how much you can get mm. her to pony up for the speakers. And I would, if possible, you know, this is something you have to spend some time with. Uh, I don't think you necessarily have to have her listen to it, but I think that you have to go out there and look for some deals and uh, talk to some people, do some listening yourself. Uh, if you can get RBH in wall speakers, mm. uh, probably going to be a little by a little i mean a lot more expensive yeah. which means you're going to have to you know make sure you're you're budgeting properly for everything else but the uh the rbh speakers can um will sound will that is a sound 
purchase. That is a right. purchase that you know you are getting great sound for the money that you are spending. Uh, in a similar price range, at least in the U.S., uh, Aperion as well could be a consideration. Yeah. But that's, yeah. you know, now you're into $300 a pair. So, you know, yeah. significantly more money. Front, front, you know, front, left, right, center, mm. RBHs, and using cheaper stuff for the surrounds and the, and the overheads. That's true. Very, very do. Very, very good. There's a lot of questions here. What receiver would we recommend? You need 5.2.4, yes. the X3000. Can we do an X3000? Nope. You need your X4300H. All right. Yeah. I, which, which yeah, at the moment, range. at the moment, accessories for less doesn't have any stock, and they've let the price go back up to eight fifty. So, if that is the case, the equivalent model in Marantz's line is the SR sixty eleven. Right now, that one is at seven hundred and fifty dollars, right. and it's in stock. So, X forty three hundred H from Denon or SR sixty eleven from Marantz. Those would be the models to go for. So he's discussed the benefits of using dual subwoofers, and she's on board. Which subs do we recommend? The SB SB12 12 NSD. NSDs. Hop on them fast if you can. Get get Those her to purchase great. them now. Yeah. Uh, and what should be done in terms of acoustic treatments if we can point him to a resource that would help him diagnose and come up with a plan? Uh, he'd like to start with that. Well, you, you can read my review of the Oralex. Uh, room analysis. Yeah. That's it. Room analysis. They will hook you up. Uh, they will hook you up yep. with that. Oralex can uh, they'll do give you room analysis for free, and Gick Acoustics will give you free acoustic advice. You write to them on their form that you can find on the Gick Acoustics website under the acoustic advice section, and they'll they'll tell you stuff for free. So both of those are free. Do them both, then come talk to us because there's some stuff they'll recommend that we don't always completely agree with. Uh, but you ask for a resource to get you started. That's two great free resources. All right. So check those out, and uh, that's it, right? That's last one. It. Last question. Oh shoot! I sorry. Oh, twelve gauge wire. I yeah. started scrolling up. So, do we still recommend twelve gauge wire? Uh, sure. Just yeah. make sure you're getting uh, the right wire. Just get plenium in wall rated wire. It doesn't have to be plenum rated wall. unless you're going to put the wire through your air return. Yeah, that's true. Which that's you might true, or might true. not. It, but it needs to be in wall rated. It has to be so. in wall rated. But that's easy. You go to Parts Express or Mono Price also sells in wall rated speaker wire. Totally fine. That's the, yeah. I mean, you probably don't even need twelve gauge. Fourteen gauge is probably just fine if you want to save a few pennies there. All right. Uh, who we got left for that next week? Yeah, bro? yeah. So we got Lee and we've got Dan. Both of those questions are fairly short, so we can we can get okay. through those. But Bill is back. Bill, the fellow who's building his entire house from scratch, and oh, he's got right. some more in depth questions there. So uh, yeah, we'll we'll get to the three of you gentlemen at the beginning of next week. Yeah, and if you've got your question, all you have to do is and you would like it answered on this podcast all you have to do is send it to us email us at question at avrant.com i want to thank our all our patrons from patreon our 33 patrons i want to thank you guys and gals for supporting us especially ian uh thank josh uh daniel and tim for uh talking us up to the various manufacturers out there. Well, so the, the, all of those all were just you. SVS from their Black Friday sale. So, uh, oh, wow. That's so right. SVS is aware that. that we got the word out. We got the word out to our listeners. We at least three sales guaranteed. And I'm I'm fairly certain I missed some mentions on Twitter and that. Uh, apologies uh, if I if I missed your name. It's, it's absolutely not intentional. Uh, so yeah, want to thank Josh, Daniel, and Tim for talking us up to SVS, letting them know that we got the word out about their sale. And yeah, huge thanks to all our patrons. And if you would like to just make a one-time donation, you can do that too. Just come to avrant.com. Over on the right-hand side, there's a cup of coffee logo and it says support avrant. That takes you to PayPal. You don't have to have a PayPal account. You can just use a credit card. Or of course you can use a paypal account if you have one uh so yeah if you want to do a one-time donation that's how you can do that i want to thank josh in particular for building the box and taking a picture of it i, do I like appreciate that, that for av rant i'm tom andry and i'm rob h now go out and listen to something Once your question answered, send it to question at avrant.com.
This is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.